we started, so we're going to let these wild animals come in. Let the wild animals join us. We we know some wild animals in our lives. I'm going to wait for them oh, to come nice. in and then uh, show, them the, show them the live link. Oh, man, it's <laughs> really long right now. <laughs> there we go. We're live. Like some kind of giraffe. I'm sending you the link. Nice. Okay. You text it to me? I'm texting it to you. Nice. So I can just copy and paste. <coughs> oh, nice. I should tweet it and be like, live now. Yeah, you should definitely tweet it. And definitely no technical difficulties whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my dad can watch this too. Dad on it. I'll tweet it. Let me tweet it right now. We got 24 yes. already. We have 24 peeps in the mix already. Beautiful. Do they are they it's commenting? The... Are they saying hello? Can you? Hey can guys, you go, hey, you... chat reg. Say what's up. This is Ronnie Barda. Ronnie Barda. Hey guys. Uh, you have so so much fame. I don't even. You got the you got oh, the bracelet. Yeah, I'm old news, dude. I, it, you, uh, you know, you having me on is is, is big for me because I, I, you know, I, my peak was like 2015, 16. I'm on the decline now, bro. So this is, you know, I'm trying to but it's, make a comeback here. <laughs> Late night rally. Yeah, we're 35 people. What's up, Christopher Edward? What's going on? We got we're 35 people. All right, let's get this stuff started. What's up? What's up, guys? Z22 Soso Wing Chun Live Bike Poker Stream. This is my VIP guest, Ronnie Barda. He says he's on the decline, but you know. <laughs> it's been a long time. You shouldn't have left us. But here's the thing. I've known you for like, I don't know, around 15 years. To me, yeah, about that. To me, you're just Ronnie Barta. And then you just like pop in the news or just like when I'm propping 4080 at the bike, you walk by, you're like, do you see that Miss Finland video? I'm like, what are you talking about? And then you're like, you know, just, just, just search just search for Miss Finland. And I do it. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I'm slapping my ass off. And then well, it's on. been six. It's been six years, uh, and it just won't. It just won't stop haunting me since. I mean, it's like. I mean, not that I'm. I'm okay with the video. I, I, I the hand. It's a great hand. It's a fun hand. But it's been so long, and it still always comes up. You know, uh, I was just in Idaho recently, and some guy at a Walmart with my face mask on was like, "I know that voice." You know, and I know, you know, obviously it's not going to be from Survivor because I lasted about 16 seconds on the show. Um, it's going to be from the Miss Finland hand 90% of the time or World Series of Poker coverage, you know, or just knowing me from, you know, me being in every single poker room around the world. But obviously the guy's like Miss Finland and we started talking and took a selfie with me and it's like, it's cool. Like, I don't know why you want my selfie, but let's do it. You know, snap that selfie so but yeah it's 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 a it's, it's a cool hand it's i got tons of views people love it i love getting clowned for it when i walk into poker rooms people just want to people call me miss finland when they play hand versus like oh is this heads up versus me and miss finland and they start laughing i'm like uh well you're internationally known and locally respected so the back the back or sorry the black croc says who is this guy well let's give you an introduction you're Ronnie Barta Hold from up, the, the Boston the area. Black, the Black the Black Rock. Croc. The Black Croc. The Black Rock. Because the, the Black Croc's a person. His name is Stanley Lee. It's my boy. No, His name is Stanley Lee. It's, the Black Croc. He says you have a nice face. A, he says you have a nice face. Oh, th okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. We're at 35. We're gonna we're gonna see how many we can get. So yeah, Ronnie Barta from the Boston area. Yeah, born and raised. You did. Acapella and beatboxing in your youth? Yeah, I grew up in a town called Brockton, Mass, uh, which is about 20 minutes south of Boston. You know, blue collar, lower to middle class, upper, some upper middle class, like just pretty diverse town. Uh, you know, my childhood was very, very interesting and uh, nuts and fun and not fun. It was a lot of, a lot of good times. And uh, in high school, junior high, I recognized that I had a decent voice and People told me that I could sing, so I joined the choir in junior high. And then up up through high school, I was beatboxing a lot because I really loved ciphers, we call them, you know, where people like get in, a, get in a group and I could never rap. I could sing, but I was terrible with lyrics. So I would just provide a beat and people would 
you know, freestyle, and I would love to host battles. Uh, you know, if a couple kids wanted to battle because they just had beef, so we'd settle it over a freestyle of some sort instead of, you know, there was tons of fights growing up in Brockton, but a lot of kids just battled, you know, usually it was all in fun. They would just come at each other, low blows, left and right. Talk about Ooh. your family, your mom, where you shopped, you know, uh, just just you know, harsh, harsh lyrics. Do you remember any highlights? Of beatboxing growing up? Yeah, no, I, no, mean, I mean, any harsh disses, like some low blows. I, I mean, low blows, like we used to have these thrift stores called like this, like, you know, Salva similar to Salvation Army called MVETS. And, if, you know, if your mom was spotted at MVETS, you're like, you're going to be hurt. Like, people would let you hear about it. Well, my mom was spotted at MVETS because we didn't have much money growing up. And the thing about MVETS, they used to be this uh, arcade next to it called Channel 3 Video. They also rented you videos and they had like six, you know, Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter 2 versus Capcom, Killer Instinct, Soul Calibur, all in a row. And and miss in some old classics, of course, Miss Pac-Man or what have you. And all the kids after junior high school would go congregate, go hang out with this, you know, at this arcade. But next door, you had MVETS. And my mom one day strolled into Envents in front of everybody. And I heard about it for fucking weeks. And I said, my mom was donating clothes. And they were like, no, she walked in. You donate clothes at the dumpster. And I was like, I went home and I was literally like crying in seventh grade. And my dad told my mom that we'd have to shop at Bradley's for now on. Like just some like low, you know, really cheap department store instead of Envents. But all in all, your know, thrift stores are cool. I go there now and I'm proud of it. I love, you know, I have, I have more money than I ever had when I was a kid. And I love going to thrift stores and buying old people's clothes, like 70s style or cool sweaters. And like when I travel, I, I like I like that shit. Cool. Now it's a cool thing. You know? Yeah, don't don't waste, man. So how did you get into poker? Oh, that's a that's a long, interesting story. But uh, basically, my you know when I say this, I'm not I don't like, like speaking poorly of my parents, but they were degens. You know, my. My dad could have done a lot with the money, his income and the money he made in the 80s and 90s, but he he loved to gamble. He loved going to the local dog track. Where I grew up, it was Raynham Dog Track or Suffolk Downs. Um, there was also, like, Foxwoods opened up in 92 and then Mohegan Center in 95. And my dad was constantly there. If it wasn't weekends at the casinos, it was weekdays at the dog track, or if he, he needed a quick fix, we'd go to a local restaurant and play Keno, buy some scratch tickets, you know, and I grew up in that environment. And my mom was influenced by my dad. She became a gambler. And any extra income after providing the necessities like food on a table and clothes on our back, they would spend any extra dollars going out and gambling. So, you know, when I was 16 years old, I got a fake ID. Uh, uh, you know, back in the day, it was easier to get fake IDs because they were like all laminated. And, we had some experts in my bride grew up, kids know how to make them. And like, yeah. My friend had a main driver's license connection. And in the 11th grade, I got a fake ID in my name. He asked me what I'm, what am my name, what, like what I wanted my name to be. And I said, Elijah Jones, because Elijah Wood was my favorite actor growing up. And Jones was Nazir's last name with my favorite rapper. So I put the two together. I was like, Elijah Jones sounds like a great name. So the kid came back, he's a Cape Verdean kid. Uh, he was in bilingual classes, didn't speak the best English, but he came in and the, the idea was great, but my name was Alaha Jones. Mm. That's my name. He <coughs> made me mistake Elijah. Sorry, I'm choking on this. Granola. <coughs> Elijah to Alaha. So my name for three years was, I called myself Al when I went to Foxwood. <laughs> but in the, from 17 to 20, I was mostly in the pits. Like my dad played some poker. I remember. He played a lot of one to five stud and five ten dollar stud. Mm. One to five, he would Andy with half dollars, and I would jump in the game, and he would make fun of me and yell at me and tell me I know what, like embarrass me in front of everybody we're playing with. So I was kind of like intimidated. So I would just go back into the pits and blow thousands playing blackjack or win thousands and Caribbean stud, you know, blackjack and and uh, let it ride. And I would play games with bonuses on it like an idiot. I have a really interesting story. I hit a bonus for five thousand dollars with a fake, but I also had my friend's ID and I got paid in his name. Wow. He was five foot, he was five, five and I'm six, one. And yet I used the idea when I went to the window to catch the, the I got, I, I like crunched down and I was like, <laughs> and I remember, I, I could tell you the kid's name, address right now, social security. I still remember it all because I had to memorize it. And yeah, 
I hit the lucky, I hit seven suited seven, seven of clubs, seven of clubs, seven of clubs for 5,000 for a dollar bonus thing. I got paid. But yeah, to answer your question, that's how I got into poker. My parents were just huge degens. I mean, unfortunately, they could use the money for to better our lives and we could have lived in a better neighborhood. We could have had access to, you know, better education and what have you. But, um, you know, it is what it is. And uh, they did they did best, I, I guess. Uh, my parents divorced pretty young. So they divorced when I was 13. And at that point, it was just me and my dad. So at that point, I was always in the casino. Because my dad, the way he handled the divorce, he just wanted to gamble and he gambled the house. We lost our house in 1997. My dad declared bankruptcy and then we moved to like housing projects in Brockton where it was just me and him. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. And then I became professional around 2000. I had a job at Sears Automotive. I was playing in the pit still, playing some poker. And then the poker just kind of overtook playing in the pits. Like I started playing cards. I was like, yo, this is, I can make money doing this. Yeah. And then I started working less hours at the garage and going in to play poker. You know, I never went to college. You know, I didn't. I don't have a college a college education. I went for like a half semester to some community college, and I was just like smoking tons of weed back then, not caring, not knowing what direction I wanted to go in. And, and uh, fortunately, poker, you know, I was making doing well, and I really loved it. And I was so so passionate about poker then. Not that I'm not now, but you remember the days like 2003 with the boom, goal four. The way you used to look down at two aces was like. Like you just fell in love. Like, like yeah, we look down at aces like, oh shit, I got aces, you know, all right. We'll see what we can do with the current situation, how much money we can make, hopefully we get action, hopefully we can you know. But back then you looked down at like King Seven of Diamonds and you just thought you were like, Jesus Christ, this is beautiful. I still do. Every hand looked amazing. <laughs> yeah. People depending which era you played with me, you could have very, very different images. But um or shout out your Boston crew or all the people. We got BK, Big Bob K, Diamond Joe, Joe the Jeweler. Oh, my God. Joe the Jeweler. I gave yeah, Joe the David. Jeweler one of the worst beats of all time. And, you know, he had this massive downswing, one that I've never even experienced. He was literally losing every well, hand in, like, high stakes. Th yeah. That guy swings through the fences. I mean, he, he's, uh, yeah. You don't know what's the situation. If he's super pumped or he's, like, you know, but... He's always playing the biggest games, yeah. and he, you know, he's got a family, and you know, he's got some money from the jewelry business. Like, um, he's got a side hustle, but he's 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 pretty pro -y. I wouldn't call him a wreck. You know, he's he's you know, because like, like if, for me, if you're somebody who's making your money strictly from poker, and like now I was like I'm a, obviously most of my money, hundred percent of my money, basically from poker. Uh, you know, I've had some side gigs. I've, you know, been on a couple TV shows, and I've made money, you know, a little money in the stock market with crypto, but nothing to like. I'm not rich, and I didn't get, you know, had the opportunity to get rich like four or five times over. I just didn't. We all did. You know, I'm a net. I'm a fucking net. It's too bad. You know, I, I, I've never been broke. That's a. And so that's the good thing about it. But it's. it's I compliment you a lot about this because it like you know you have the ability to play you know a lot bigger and you just stick with the mid stakes and crush which is a lot more stable and um yeah i mean like i was yeah. talking with ryan fee like how many people i know didn't go broke you know you're one of them there's probably like 10 maybe 20 people who just like never ever <laughs> went broke but you yeah, know like the thing is like it's, it's something that you said go ahead i'm sorry if i answered it. Oh no! It's just like you know, people like Garrett and Andy or whatever. They all went broke like one, maybe yeah, two, but they, three times. They, yeah. yeah, but they, in order to make millions, you need to go broke. It's like you want to stay stagnant and just like, you know, for me, I don't have that support to lean back on. I I do now. I have tons of resources. I have tons of good friends and who are doing well. That if I ever needed help, I I could definitely. I have a lot of avenues to go and reach out for. But I just something. I was never one to want to, like, I had too much pride growing up. I, my dad taught me never to ask anybody for anything. But there's something to be said about taking shots in your 20s. For any young people watching right now, when you're young and you can easily make money doing other things, gamble, like life's a gamble, take those risks and, and put yourself out there. If you go broke or something happens, you're 24, don't worry. Like, you're still, like, I'm 37 now, and I'm not saying I'm a fucking, I'm an old man, but, you know, there's, being broke at 37 is it's not not fun so what i'm saying is when you're young like you want to take a shot at a big game or invest some money into something that you, a business that you think might do well but it has a you know it's high risk a lot of most businesses fail 
take those shots because you never know what could come from it. You can get super rich. And if you go broke, you can fucking restart over again and you're still 22, you're still 26. You still you still got that 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 drive and that energy to go out there and produce. I still have it, but you know, I wish I took, I don't live life with regrets, but I wish I took more shots at bigger games in my early age. I wish when I had a few hundred thousand that I invested a bunch in different things. I have invested my money in some good, like I'm like, again, in, like I have my money in tech funds that, are, you know, uh, mutual funds with Vanguard and I have my money in low risk stuff, but nothing high. And uh, I guess there's something good to be said about that as well. You know, I have anything set up, but at the same time, you know, I, I wish I took I mean, we know how many people went. We we probably don't even know how many people went broke. Just even with our own networks, so many people are just like not in action. And was it their ability? Maybe not their ability. Is their lifestyle bad choices? Like commonly, there's pits. Women and drugs are the big problems in like you know this industry. Oh yeah, I mean a big a big a big uh, leak for me with women. You know that that I like. In terms of like when I say women, I, I'm not somebody who goes out and uh, messes with call girls or anything like that. I'm just saying I chased a lot of girls uh, in my 20s. If I, you know, just running around and I just, you know, date, but it's nothing. To, it's nothing wrong with that. It's fun. You know, you, you're young, you're, you're decent looking or not, whatever. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. But you find these girls, you hang out and you spend money and you go into clubs and you're you're just in the you're in the club scene. You're spending thousands of dollars on fucking tables, and uh, it's a, like I wish I focused more on you know business in my 20s and making money but i don't regret it it was the fucking great time i'm right now i'm uh, you know a, a shell of myself from my 20s i'm more calm i like to do yoga i like to hike i like to meditate if i can i like to you know for me a good day is making a great smoothie in my vitamix and uh, paleo pancakes in the morning and then follow it up with some stretching and some some wusai exercises you know so but uh yeah the le leaks are real P drugs you know uh, the pits, I can say there's so many players that are a lot better than I am, but they're just not, they're, they're, they're a lot worse than I am in terms of balancing their life around poker and doing the right things when they leave the table with the profits. And if you want to, if you want to be a successful poker player, it's crazy, but more than half of the, like that formula happens off the table, nothing right. to do with the game. If you, you know, like, there's some of the best players in the world. Are constantly broke, and they get put in these big tournaments. And I, I don't want to call anybody out. There's, you know, you know them. I know them. There's so many. They're so good at poker, but they're just so bad at life. Or, you know, but whatever. They just have. They just. They can't be trusted with money. They. They just. They're degens. They're, you know, they love it's drugs or you know just not good at managing their money and they're like children. So to touch up what you said, like, you know, stud hold them on full tilt. There's a lot of people who are just like super solid winners. They're still around. A lot of them, you know, didn't go broke. There's something to be said about that. Like, I I was reasonably aggressive when I was younger. Uh, I didn't take every spot. So I, I, I could have been more aggressive as well. But I, you know, wanted to keep a foot well, on I the mean, base. Yeah. Yeah. These, like, look, look, I, and I'm not, this is. This is my worst that my worst uh, downfall on poker is I don't study, which is for people watching study. Like get out there, learn the newest stuff that people are doing, learn these charts and these solvers. Get in there and get a coach. It's something I always tell myself the last, especially the last two three years. Like, poker is becoming so hard and changing, hard. Yeah. especially with the climate that we're in now. It's all online and it's just a different game. Like I thrive off my my ability to engage with people at the table, live reads, just the flow and the energy in the game. It's what I thrive off of, and I do really well in, in, in a live setting. Online, I've been struggling, and I don't even play that much anymore. And, like, you know, if you want to be up and up, you need to study. You need to get the content that's out right now. You need to get a coach. You need to take these different, you know, uh, paths to becoming a better poker player. And I wonder if it I, – I, I'm sure it would benefit my game if I got a coach, you know, and started to study more st – study more, study at all. Like, the only studying I do is talking hand histories with friends or – you know, rarely putting on something on YouTube like high stakes poker and watching it and be like, oh, that's interesting that Garrett played a hand like this or, you know, the fate or holds the abyss in a tournament, which is pretty cool. But I don't study whatsoever. I just fucking show up. It's kind of my motto in life is I live day by day and I'm not much of a planner uh, and I just show up. And 
it's been successful to a point and I've had a good life so far, but for me going forward, I really want to become more of a planner, somebody who's executing certain things. Like the one big thing we can talk about later is like, I made it my passion to get on Survivor and I achieved that and you know, ultimately failed. I mean, there's 19, like, you know, failed and being the first one off and what have you, but uh, yeah, we'll get to that later. But uh, that's one thing that I actually like sought out to do. Like I'm going to get on, fuck, I, I was like, I'm getting on this show. And I did, and that was a huge accomplishment. And chat to Garrett, who was on the show too. So I know that you and some other people who systematically went up did, you know, say the same things with regret or they didn't have those big, super big scores. Like I actually, you know, I, I think that you guys are on the upper echelon, the people who did make those big scores, you got to run really good in those big games. It's not like you're not a favorite and a lot of lives are ruined in those like big games. Like even, um, you know, I have like, like you on the podcast, like he's a, no one's going to say he's a bad player, but like if you in the big spots, you know, even if you're a massive favorite, they don't go your way. It's going to happen. And it's just like, we know how it is too. Gut shot, you know, 10%, you know, set draw or one out or 4.4, 2.2%. It happens. And if they happen at key does, times, uh... then you know like there's some key there's some key hands like key hands that can change your life like yeah and i i used to be one who used to like not i used to have a friend named jesse seminelli from boston shout out to jesse he's watching probably not but he's a big twitter guy so maybe he is he used to tell me that like people run better than others i said like no yes. it's a, it's over a long term it's all the same we all run the same but yeah that might be true but who runs better in the big spots and the key, key flips down in huge tournaments like I've, I've gotten so close, like main events where I lost aces all in pre or I ran ace king suited into aces down to 24 in the main event where like if I just been able to make the final table, my life would be completely different. Yeah, I scored for 300,000 in 2010, mm -hmm. but if I made that final table, I could have made a couple million, which is a huge difference, obviously. It sets you up for life. And, you know, you get a couple houses and now you're getting more residual income and, and money different, from different places. So yeah, it's, it's like you play, f if I play 40, 80, for six months straight, and I look in the corner, and there's a 200, 400 game at the Commerce with like four, five killers, but like three huge whales or, you know, inexperienced players. I take a shot in that game, and I might sell a piece, or I might just get it on my own. If I lose 30, 40K, that's like, that's like, imagine winning 30, 40K that session, and now you're just like, oh, maybe I'll play again, or I'll play 100, 200 more consistently. And I, things can change over the course of fucking one session, because now this is 5X the amount you usually play. If I lose 30k, you know how long it takes me to make that in 40, 80? Like three, it's like two, three months. I gotta go back and grind and like. So you hear that story often. Like I'm, I'm close to New Hizzle, like No House. He's a guy who's gone broke, you know, three different times and gone to a million two different times. And like I love the kid. He lives in Vegas now. We've gone hiking a few times. Uh, but he's one, you know, who like can't con like he can't play online because he can't control himself. That's like me too. I put two thousand dollars on. Uh, you know, online back in the day or like on ACR, I, just, I can't grind. I can't just play like small limit hold them. I just jump in the biggest games and it, the money's gone. And playing online, like for me, and I know for a lot of people it's the same way, like everything's so magnified. Like four, eight dollar, eight dollars, like me playing like 20, 40 in the casino, you know, 10, 20 limit hold them for me online is like 40, 80 in the casino. It, I mean, obviously everything plays bigger online because it's much faster, but I don't have the chops to grind online. And it's it's recognizing that and knowing when to, to cut your losses or how to be. I just I just when I'm in front of a fucking computer and I'm sitting there and I'm like two tabling, I don't like it. I get anxiety. I get depressed after playing for three hours. My eyes are like falling out of my fucking head. I I, I want to be. I, I want to go. I want to go shoot the shit with like you know a few funny guys at the poker table. You know that's why I love limit hold'em because everybody's talking to each other. And everybody's like, well, "Why do you play limit?" I play no limit. I could. People are watching think I I could beat a I could beat the five ten at Bellagio regularly yeah. in two five games. I did it for years, but I don't want to be there. I want to play limit hold'em. I want to play limit games because I love the camar camaraderie. Can I say that camaraderie. Right? Yeah. I love the camaraderie. I love the the, the 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 banter. I love the talk. I love the flow of the game. Everything's so quick. Everything's so easy. It's just so. It's great. It's a great game. Limit hold'em is a great game. There's definitely like something to say about longevity. You you touched upon some really good points, and just like in the poker world, it's not linear. Like there's the like people obviously 
have the the most eyes on the highest stakes no limit hold them online on camera but you know in LA it's spread out between no limit limit hold them mixed games PLO and the seven card studs dead but it was also the one or two under was running like six days a week and like if you want to make a living in poker you just figure out where you're best at like you don't want to play online don't play online you know you don't want to play in those leagues like there's a lot of respectable like low stakes grinders are playing one two no limit and they're making 40 an hour and you're just not threatened in that game yeah, I mean, it's just it's the same kind of aspect of life. You find out what you're good at, and you fucking crush that. Yeah. You know, it's with poker. If you're if you're like the best, you know, Raz player in the world, you know, look for Raz games. That's really hard to find out. But I mean, like, if you're the best mix. Like, you know, we all know the mixed game guys. But like you said, there's only a few places in this in the country where you can have all these games and these options. L.A. being one of them. Vegas, yes, there's some good mixed games and. You know, you have your variation of different games. Like Ari is known as the PLO room. Win is kind of known as a no limit room now. Uh, which Bellagio is too. Limit hold them, obviously. Everybody goes to the Bellagio. Um, you know, and it is what it is. But there's nowhere really else in the country. Bogota and Parks. There's some ver- there's some different you know variations. You can play mix and seven stud and you know I like I love seven. I mean stud eight's kind of you know it's not dead. A lot of, there's like a lot, stud eight game in Bellagio. I know they play like it's in the mix and there's they play like triple stud they play stud they play like, HOE at parks and you know but if you live in places like the south like Florida and it's all PLO no limit like that's what it is everywhere mostly two five is the is the uh, most popular game and uh, yeah this for the dudes who my uh, hats off to the guys grinding one two and two five making forty to seventy an hour like you're your own boss you do what you gotta do you're making money you know but for me kind of come off a little of the subject we're talking about like 50 percent of the time i'm at the table now half the time i'm just like what am i doing here you know that's like the last two years i'm looking around and i'm like when i'm not it's, it's not that i'm not like i just need more purpose you know and that's what i've been trying to figure out this last couple of years and obviously with covid we, we all have time to sit back and, and really reflect on life and think about you know what we're doing with our lives and what what's next for us and hopefully when things go back to normal what what's what what are we gonna do like you know i didn't have my life set up and i'm sure like you know i a lot of people who had their shit set up and stuff i think it may be a bit of me they have children or they're married and they had a running business that hopefully still thriving in through through corona or Oof. took a few took a hit but yeah i know a lot of business called or they had something they were working on i kind of just got off survivor I was traveling, not you know, not figuring it out as always, and I just got back to the states, and boom, Corona's here. And now I have to move out of my dad's place, and that I bought for him, and I'm subletting near him in Vegas and taking care of him. And it's like, you know, trying to get unemployment that hasn't came through. Like with a lot of people, are struggling getting that. A lot of friends of mine got unemployment, I haven't received it, so it's tough. You know, thankfully I have some money I can sit back on, but that will last a couple of years, and I'll, you know, what am I gonna do then? You know, so I'm really focusing now on figuring out is it a business is it you know finding a niche and crushing is it you know getting into real estate but i i'm never going to do something i don't enjoy it i i i stress to my viewers out there yeah it's easier said than done if you're not happy in your current position but you got to pay the bills people feel stuck yeah. do something that makes you happy but it, like how many people are doing things that make them happy that they're monetizing and just crushing it's like very two percent of a, you know, yeah. it's tough you know it's hard Definitely, yeah, I mean, you touched up on all these good points, and we had talked about this in the last few years, too. And I was to touch up, like, somebody on Twitter asked, like, how good you ran in your career. And even though I went broke once, I'd say, I'd have to say, overall, I'm probably, like, a 9 or a 10. Because I did have times where, you know, I ran it up, and I must have got, you know, ran good in, in key spots. And something that people don't necessarily know is when you even if you're doing things responsibly you have like you know six high six figure seven figure bank roll that money doesn't last that long if you just like do nothing for a couple of years you spend that like really quickly mm-hmm. so this is well the- you get you get 
get used to go ahead sorry the systematic thing that you were doing and just like you know you're trying to do other things so definitely credit you shouldn't sell yourself short like getting on survivor or going to the shark cage on poker stars with miss finland <laughs> but the all these other things like this is something that you actually had a head start on me like getting in the mix whereas like i just started getting on live with the bike like four and a half years ago and i you know me i'm just consistently grinding but this actually creates like real world value the problem as we know is if you're just grinding and you're you're touching up right now is like you know you're in your late 30s you're at the poker table you're not building anything yeah i mean it's nice that you pick up three thousand you're like where else am i going to do this right now with my life you know like it's it's hard to, to find something that's a business get a business idea execute it have it be successful it may take three four years of hard work and then you sit back and your business is running itself and you're making you know twenty thousand a month that's the dream or third whatever you're making three four hundred k a year yeah but like you get that quick fix where you just say oh i'm gonna go fucking play 40 80 and make and you and you make three four thousand a session now like when you lose it when you win it when you're winning and you're running well and you're playing well i mean things are going great you're like this is the life and when you lose you stop questioning life it's like yeah what uh, what i could have i could have what could i've done with that 4700 i could have paid this i could have done that this would have paid for this cooking class i could have gotten into an improv i could have done this i would have paid for a music lesson <laughs> whatever uh you start you know but like i, I i'm not I, I know it's all one long session i'm somebody who who try working on like not always counting how much I'm how I'm doing, but I I'm the kind of meticulous and like a nit where I was just like I always know how much I'm down or up in a session. That's a weakness. Like it's good to know what's going on, but like you gotta always play your best and just fucking play. It's all one long session for us pros. And but um, yeah, what, you were you were touching up on uh, to, 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 I was in the fall. You were saying about how people somebody asked how good you ran in your career. You say yeah. nine or ten. It you has know, like, to for be, me to say. Yeah. It, yeah, for me to say I ran like average would be, you know, kind of tilting for people to, to maybe think about. I've got cash the main event five years in a row. I've won a bracelet. I've, I've made three final tables it's... basically the World Series of Poker. I've, you know, I've had a really good life uh, in my 20s, 30s. Been rough the last couple of years with some issues that we'll talk about a little later. But, you know, I ran pretty good. I've had a great life. You know, I love life. Uh, it's It's been fun ride. It's just the roller coaster now is like, just going straight, maybe down a little, and it's like, well, I'm like, what am I? When am I gonna feel good about something? When am I gonna? I just wanna be part of a fucking project. I just wanna, I wanna wake up in the morning and feel like, yes, like I'm so happy about like like I used to when I used to wake up in the morning and be like, oh, two hours I gotta register for this tournament. You, know, it's, uh, you have, like, oh, like, you know, I feel you have a better head start. You have foundation. Like I said, you have you know content. You have videos of you yeah. playing poker. That's like the very, it's a very underrated starting point. Because we know there's a lot of like crushers, mid stakes and nosebleed stakes that the public does not know about. Well, those guys don't, most of those guys don't really want to be known about. They love, right. you know, they love that under, under, you know, that kind of, you know, under the radar reputation. They don't really want people to know how, how you know, how they're doing. And I'm somebody who, like, well, I, I'd be lying if I said I like, you know, being poker famous or having some notoriety and being known in my profession and, you know, but to be honest, like, there's a lot of guys like, you know, the Jeff Grosses and these other guys that really market themselves extremely well, the Johnny Vibes and these people that put themselves out there. I don't put myself out there. Like, you know, I appreciate you reaching out to me and I always say yes to any podcast, but these people like actually emailing podcasts and emailing poker stars and, and, and putting resumes together to get these online deals or working for being a show for ACR or I just I just don't do I, I've never tried to leverage any of my success where not to blow smoke up my own ass but I I've had a lot more coverage than some of these people or people know me and I don't do anything with it where they've had a fraction of the exposure and they've they've turned that into things that are making them tons of money and my hat's off to them and like I wish you know I wish I had that drive to like put together a, 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 some kind of like, uh, you know, resume and just forward it to Party Poker and talk to Rob Young. Like Rob Young follows me on on Twitter. He follows like 380 people. I don't know why he followed me. Maybe he likes my personality. He works for Party Poker. You're good He's guy, a nice dude. guy. <laughs> well, well, well like maybe I should, like, I should reach out to him and be like, hey, sure. you know, uh, 
I could be like a potty poker pro. I'm like, you know, I could I could stream and do all this cool stuff online and have like Ronnie Bart a Twitch channel. I'm like those things have popped in my head, but I don't do them. Like if you don't, my my boy used to always, my boy Jesse used to always talk about oh this this fucking girl. She's always she, she would talk about Vanessa Selps or you know any good poker player that is crushing and they're like they're winning every tournament. I'm like, dude, you can't win a tournament if you don't fucking play. You know, like, you know, a lot of people just get, like, they anti-sweat people and they get so mad when other people win. That's something I used to be a part of, that East Coast mentality, kind of, like, sarcastically depressed and, like, just making this. But, you know, I made a shift in 2010-11 and I support, you know, I like to be a supporter and I like to see people do well. I never, never not like seeing people do well, but I would, like, buy into that, like, anti-sweating and, you know, uh, there's some people who I don't want to see do well. Or they're actually big pieces of shit in the poker world. I root against some people. But for the most part, like when people win, it makes me happy, and I, I love seeing people succeed. I definitely do too, and especially with my position, like all I push, like whether I get along with somebody or I don't get along with somebody, I'm like I gotta push for positive qualities because especially we're broadcast on the internet now, and especially live with the bike, such a huge platform now. I'm just like, you know what? If somebody's gonna preach degening, I can't be on board with that. This is real life. And it's okay if it, I'm not as popular or, you know, it's whatever. Just like I gotta slowly move the needle. And this goes. This isn't just go for poker. It's like entrepreneurship, like life, like everything. Like you said, you could take risks earlier in life. Making the leap to take a risk early in life is easier than scaling back. Like after, especially after you tasted victory, like you you have run it up or you have good projects. And then when you get punched in the face by real life and it's time to like scale it back, that's actually one of the hard things, especially for poker players and entrepreneurs psychologically, when it's like they have that memory. I did it once, they do it again. But remember the person you were when you did it. You were driven, you were hardcore, you calculate every fraction of an edge and you did it. And now what are you doing? You're saying, I used to be like this, you know, I could, I'm this, I'm that. I'm just like, yo. <laughs> You know, when you, when you start that new project and your office is dirty, scrub the floor. Just like when Mark Cuban uh, asked his brother, his brother came in with like a suit and tie. He's like, okay, let's get going. And then Mark Cuban's like, what the hell are you doing? Like, we're, we're moving boxes. <laughs> this yeah. is, you're not sitting back and relaxing. So whatever grind that you did on the way up, if things don't go well, you have to look. You have to scale it back and just be like, "Yo, this is reality." Like, <laughs> so I. I mean, yes. honestly, like I know you're hard on yourself because you have really high standards, but like you should apply your career, making it this far. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I I sit back and I reflect and I think about how blessed I am to have done so many different great things and on different avenues, and you know, I've traveled the world, and uh, it's it's you know, a lot of people will trade places and. You know, I know it could be far worse, but sometimes I don't like comparing myself to like people doing worse or doing better. It's just, just focus on yourself. You can't try yeah. to be a better person. You're just gonna, you know, I'm just completely, you know, um, blessed to have a big heart. You know, it's my my best thing I've had. I, I, out of my, you know, everything that I have in life, I'm most grateful for my heart because it doesn't lie and it's it's extremely loving and it loves. It just it it, it never never go never does me wrong. Like I, my heart tells me to do something, I should follow my heart and I, I express. I tell people out there, to, you know, do the same because your heart will, most people will lead you the right way unless you're, unless you're like Hitler or something, you know, but, um, yeah, so, but it, it is hard to like, so, you know, for a lot of people, so it's survivor, like they get that, they never had any exposure and they get on this huge TV show and they, they have this high for like a few months prior getting on the show and then the, it, it airs and they get some, and all of a sudden it's over for them and they don't know what to do. They're like, like they, they, they think they're going to be this huge TV star or, you know, very, very few people are remember, are, are remembered from the game and, or, or ask to come back. And for a lot of people, it hurts. They like try to find that same fix again. It kind of, that's what it reminded me when you said that, like, you know, for me, I, I, I am, I'm, I guess like to relate to that, I'm looking for something to feel passionate about. Like, you know, I am passionate about nutrition. I'm passionate about helping people or just, being in like in the public and speaking and talking and you know I'm not the one who, I'm not the greatest per like I don't articulate myself that well I can get my feelings across pretty decently but you know I'm working on like like reading more and trying to uh, expand my vocabulary but 
it is extremely hard to to find that passion again for you know which we, if you're not happy you're not passionate about something and you don't have much purpose then you kind of feel like you're in a load of, you get depressed you know and I know a lot of people are dealing with depression right now with COVID-19 at home yeah. and, you know they just don't know what to do with themselves or they're in a relationship they don't want to be in or they figure out they're in a relationship they really want to be in which is great you know, uh, and there's a lot of divorce going on a separation or people quitting their jobs or you know suicide rates are, are, are so high right now which is very sad and, no, uh, we're in a tough times. That's for damn. That's for damn sure. So regarding just like you know trying to do the jump off and different things, you know, me in the last few years, I keep needling you to just like get started, get started. I believe in you, man. Like every needle that I do, you're always like, I know, I know. One of these days, one of these days, I'm gonna be like Ben Affleck in Goodwill Hunting when you're like Will Hunting. You know, the best part of my day is Ronnie Bart is too big time to even talk to me. <laughs> yeah, right. That'll never happen. I just, I, I, yeah, I've never, I, you know, people, if some people said at big time in the past. It's like, I think, not to say, I feel like some people just have some insecurities, but if somebody annoys me, I'm just not going to like, you know, somebody talks to me often. I, I always like everybody who Facebook messaged me about how to become a poker pro or, Ooh, you know, they Instagram me how to be. How do I become a pro? Or how do I get on Survivor? Or how do I do this? Or what do you? What can you? What advice? I answer everybody, but if somebody sends me naked pictures of themselves, I stop talking to them. Or if somebody like is extremely annoying and keeps going off, I stop talking to them. Or says there's a lot of crazy people out there. You just have to be careful. And you have to like, I'm getting into a lot of like you know energy work, and I like you know I'm not extremely spiritual yogi or anything, but there's a lot to be said for that. Like giving yourself. And your energy to certain people can be toxic, and you just got to be yeah. careful who you intertwine, intertwine with out there in the real world because people can take from you some of your energy or drag you down or make you feel bad or say things or do. It's like you know. Didn't you Drake you just got a senate? Didn't Drake say huh? this? Didn't Drake say this? <laughs> got a lot. Energy, got a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, you just got to be careful who you deal with because, like, you know, you got to you've got a certain light people want to take from it. You know, but I like I like look. I'm a, I'm loyal to a fault. I'm loyal to my friends I've known since day one. If you're like a brother to me, no matter what you go through, I got your back. You know, but there's a lot of people doing really bad right now, and you don't really know them, or you're not that close to them, and they just want to attach yourself, like they come at you, and you just you just you feel kind of bad that you don't you can't be there for everybody. Like I I know so many people, so my energy is constantly, you know, going out talking to different types of people all the time, and. You just gotta take time for yourself sometimes. You owe yourself that. You owe yourself some a little time to, you know, self love and self you know, self work and just it's it's really beneficial. You just gotta you, you owe yourself that. So I was I obviously know. joking about the goodwill hunting thing. I know you'd never big time me. I was about to I, I, know, I was joking. Yeah, but no, I, I, I would love I, to be part of, I wanna be part of some Boston movie. That was, <laughs> if like Mark Wahlberg asked me to be like some flick, I'll like, fucking jump on that like or any like Boston rated like Boston based movie, I would love to be in. That'd be really really cool because I got the accent already, obviously, and I have, you know, I would love to be in some movie. Maybe I can play like a good kid or try to be the best dog I could be or something in some kind of like you know, a pot or something, part two or whatever. The question that you get for like how do you get on Survivor, how do you be a poker pro? It's just like people are looking for direct answers and. One, yeah, I don't give them direct answers, but clearly to get on Survivor or you know Live the Bike or something, there's like a lot of you know it's cliche, but there's a lot of luck and chance. Like you have to be building stuff on the way, and then when opportunity comes up, like recently I was on uh, National Geographic Brain Games. What people don't <clears> know <throat> is like you know I was approached to like recruit people i actually sent that invite to like garrett to joe ingram to doug polk whatever and they all passed and then it got to the point where like well i might as well go on you know like obviously national geographic games brain games and i was on with brain like libri igor kurganov and alec torelli where it's like i could be selfish and just like take it all myself but like i think like you know garrett joey and doug especially in this generation like they should be the ones representing you know but if they pass mm -hmm. you know like it's my turn to, 
Yeah, Joey is an interesting character when he came on the scene. I was like, who the, who the hell is this kid? How is he rep? Like, who? You know, Joey Ingram. And now, like, you, you don't imagine the poker world without him. You know, Dude. it's like as years go by, he's got he solidified his place in the poker world. He's he's the he's the news. You know, he's the guy who's like you you wait for the info. You you see what's the current events in poker and Doug Polk as well. I love Doug's videos. Like, huge fan of Doug Polk. Love his content. Love watching them. I think he's really creative, extremely funny. Um, you know, Joey's just like you know, the news. Like he's all over the place. I know he's he loves uh, the UFC and he's getting into that as well. But you know, my hats off to those guys. And guys like you know, my friend Timo, Johnny Vibes. He's great with the videos. Great, you know, great vlogger. And I just you know, I appreciate that world. I, I'm a fan. I like watching from time to time. I I, I watch Doug Polk mostly, but like you know, it's 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 cool what what how did i go oh yeah it's this this bit this uh brain games you were on i didn't even know you were on that i didn't know like, oh i I, I, I bluffed out ted danson nice i don't even yeah, I have no idea how the game works or I'll, 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 my neck looks, i'll send you the link but it, it's not a big deal it, it's more just like get on the list even if you're number 20 or number 100 or number 1000 get get some tangible things out there like whether it's you're on video yeah or you know, to get to get on to get on these shows you have to have a story you have to have you, you gotta to be, be able so to tell lucky a story. too like the the you're gonna uh, be yourself opportunity. yeah, this yeah. Is, it's, it's survivor like, is extremely extremely hard to get on you sure know? it's like yeah. shit there's only been 500 people in the last 20 years that play the game and you know my my advice when people want to get on survivor is uh you know create a video you know talk about your life uh and be yourself be able to tell a story you know, don't don't push, don't force. You know, they CBS and Survivor. You know, they're they're two different. They work together. They're two different companies, but they they know if somebody's being their genuine self. They've they they have like psych psych like psychology experts, and it's a huge process getting on the show. But they know when you're being inauthentic. They know when you're forcing it. They know when you're like not you're trying to be somebody else. And it's reality TV for a reason, and it's real. Like. It's nothing more real than getting on Survivor and playing the game. Like people ask, "Oh, you get put up in a hotel? Do you, did they feed you?" No. Like you get rations of fucking rice if you can cook it. You have to search for coconuts. And I'm sorry if I'm, I'll try to. Uh, no, no, you know, no, 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 no. It, this is the, all the f bomb. Be real. Be real. You know. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's. I still have so much love for the show. If they do a first boot season, maybe I'll get back on. Um, because I was first off, and those reasons why I was first off. Uh. But yeah, I, I have so much love for Survivor. Garrett was second off, you know, Anna Kate, who I don't dislike Anna Kate. I friendly with her. We've had many conversations. You know, I don't agree with her politics and the things she says for the most part. She says a lot of things that I do can agree with, but she was really not a poker player. You know, when she got on, she used the title to really benefit herself and make herself a bit more interesting and they were a little bit. But, you know, Garrett, myself, um, John Robert, when he went on, he wasn't really that famous. He kind of had like he was like obviously very personable and it's fun TV. But we, I mean, John Rabir did the best season fifteen China like years ago. He went pretty deep. But I, my main thing when I went on Survivor is I wanted to be a clear representation of a poker player. Like this is a grinder. Like this is a good fucking guy. He's been playing his whole life. This is what a poker player is made out of. This is what happens when you play for so many years. This is a, a this is the person. And like, because Garrett, when he got casted, he was an online guy. He was really young. He hasn't been around the game that long. John Robert, same thing. He was just like 2006 or seven or whatever. He's been playing for a couple of years. And he's like, you know, he, he he makes a living being sociable and like getting in the biggest games. And Anna, we already talked about her. So I'm, a, I'm like the ultimate grinder. I've been playing for years. I made a name for myself. And somebody, I was the first poker player who got on that, it was actually like known, like really well known. Like John Robert is really well known now. Garrett, no, arguably that obviously no argu no argument. He's the best out of all of us in terms of poker skills. But people like I was ready, man. I was ready to show what the strengths of becoming a poker player over the years and being so sociable and being able to engage with everybody in different walks of life and being well liked and being well loved and and just being a good guy. How far that could take me in the game survival? But something happened. I got casted. I was fucking great, feeling well. Can we talk about this now? Yeah, let's go. Is what we're talking about. I 
you know, I don't want to be be one to come across like I'm I'm using this as an excuse because it's 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 what happened. It's real. Um, you know, I'm a very practical, logical individual. I pride myself to be one who's very strong-minded. Uh, when I got casted, uh, things were great. I was ready. You know, I I not casted. I was being considered. And you go through casting, and they give you your last. When you get through finals, you get your immunization shots, and that's four or five months before leaving, or four and a half months. With three months left, I started. You know, this is a bit, you know, this is being vulnerable here and talking about a certain, I wouldn't call it a health issue, but something that, some chronic pain that I had happened right before going on. I started feeling some rectile and like nerve pain in the back of my, in my hips, in my butt, in the panarium area. That whole area was like not, it was like a dull and it was extremely painful to sit down. And automatically I thought it was like urological. So I went to all these doctors who just, they didn't know. I took every test in the book about two and a half months going out on Survivor. They had no idea what was wrong with me. So I couldn't call CBS and say, hey, I, I have you know, this or this or that. But they gave me antibiotics treating me for possibly prostate issues, possibly bladder infection, possibly. But every single test I took was negative for infection or negative CAT scans or there's nothing, no mass or, you know. And at that point, I didn't realize it was neurological, which I recently, I recently got diagnosed about seven or eight months ago, but I took every measure to get better. And every path that I took to get better made me worse. And if anybody out there is listening to this, chronic pain is real. If you, you know you don't know what's wrong with you, doctors say you're okay. You know you're not a crazy person because you can feel the pain. And it's like, for me, it was one location. Left, lower, like, you know, uh, glutes, like inside and like my sacrum, I just felt like weak and it felt extremely like felt like a golf ball was in my in my rep in my rear end as funny as that sounds <laughs> but i had trouble sitting i had trouble working out i was in so much pain i was in so much pain and i took all these antibiotics i took all these alpha blockers all these anti like antidepressants that maybe work for nerves and nothing worked and now i'm a week away from going out i did an eight-day water fast as well uh in santa rosa true milk detox center and Survivor sent this thing out two weeks prior saying, is there anything new that you've been diagnosed with? Mm -hmm. And I well, I didn't have anything new. I, I said, I said no, everything's good. And on paper, I was ex I'm like the healthiest person alive. All my levels are good, there's nothing wrong with me. And I was really confident that I could deal with this on the show and be successful and be able to talk and engage and be funny and give, give the world, give CBS and Survivor world what they wanted in terms of confessionals and being hilarious and, and playing a great game. But that was exactly, the, that did not happen. I went out there pretty dilute, like the drugs and everything made me, like I was, I couldn't engage in conversations. I was all over the place. I was a bit discombobulated. That's not the right word. Like in terms I couldn't like focus. get across what I wanted to say and say, focus. See, I was like out of it, man. I was drugged out and like it's been, it's been about a year and a half since I've taken antibiotics. I feel 95, 98% better. I know what's going on. It's, it's called the dental neuralgia. I got recently diagnosed in Denver about nine months ago. I've taken, I've done the right pelvic floor therapy and the ther like right PT to, to, to get better. I don't on any medication. You know, I'm back. I'm like, I'm ready to go. And it's just sad that the timing, and it's not like the stress from going on the show did, did all this. I'm sure stress is a big component of making you worse or anything like that. but you know i've been on like the shark cage i've been on tv with espn i've been in like high stressful situations with poker like i know how to deal with that so and the, the, the pain continued for a year after almost a survivor so anyways i figured it out i'm feeling great i'm working out again uh I'm back to living life i'm back being you know extremely optimistic about it and I'm just hoping, I, I have a great redemption story. You know, I'm hoping that they do a first boot season for the biggest losers, that my ass or my tall ass neck can get back on Survivor. Look at my neck in this right now. I, look, I literally look like a fucking giraffe. Ostrich. I didn't realize how long my neck was. The ostrich, yeah, I didn't realize how long my neck was. How many viewers do we got? Do we lose people? We peaked out at over 50. We're at like okay. 36 now, but people are tuning in and out and you know, Mm -hmm. Any shout out to all y'all watching. I appreciate the support, and I'm sure Wayne appreciates the support. Always. If you have any questions, let it rip. You know, people ask any questions. 
yeah let ask me if you guys have any questions for ronnie barda and all this stuff is just like we just want to leave it up for all time because like poker gets a bad rap plus like a lot of portrayals of poker are just fake af and you know one of the things about live of the bike is it's supposed to be like the real representation at least starting from la so we've been around in la and a lot of other people and if people um who may not be the biggest names but we know they're legit grinders or they've been in the uh poker space for over a decade in live of the bike oh sam on i don't care if there's zero viewers like if they're yeah they're real then you know, and I've been needling you for like a long time, jokingly, to come on, just because it's like, when- well, I'm happy we made this happen, it's been years, I've been, I've been trying to get, you know, we were supposed to do this three, two, three years ago, <laughs> two years, we just never had another opportunity. Yeah. yeah, and just like, like I said, when we do each other, same with a lot of these poker players on TV, we started from mid, or whenever we met, I think we met when we were in mid stakes. JRB, I, I was playing the 200 no limit with the commerce. I don't even know if he remembers me and probably does because he's he's got a really good memory with people. But just like, we watched each other just like grow and just like, I don't even know how famous like Mark Newhouse, you, blah, Maria Hobo, you guys are just like in the absolute upper stratospheres. But like, I know you guys as like, you know, we used to like grind together. <laughs> yeah, I don't even, you know, I don't even, I just, like I said, I just show up and I'm happy to be here. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I would, like I said, I think my peak, my, my peak in terms of like being happy in the folk world, uh, being, you know, I obviously still well known, but like, you know, being, uh, feeling like I was on top of my game or, or, you know, it was like 2013 to 16. And now I'm like, not that I'm like on the decline. I'm just like, you know, I just want, I want more. I want more from life. Uh, poker has given me so much, and I'm very grateful for everything it's done for me. But like I said, you know, it's it's time, and it, and like I'm never gonna like at least people come out like, oh, I'm retiring from the game. I'll never put a statement on like that. And, like I'm, I, I I'm used just, to. Yeah. I'm, I'm like a big like I think you just do something. You you think about you know have an idea, and execute and do it. Don't talk about it. Just get it done. You know, people will see you. You know, not playing as much, and and then. I'm just all about interactions and people ask me what I'm doing then I'll talk about it but I'm not going to go out there and be like unless like obviously it's something that I need to market and talk about it's like maybe opening some kind of restaurant obviously I'm going to be all over social media with that but just I'm talking about from the building from the ground up like you know just get it done like it's just you just it's not going to happen itself people you know if you want if you got an idea and you think it's it's great fucking do it don't be scared of failure Failing is fu failing is great. Failing is what makes a winner. Losing, knowing how to lose in poker is is the biggest, biggest. Like you need to know how to lose. Yeah. And uh, it's like knowing how to fold. You know, I've made a living folding, and you know, I, I, I'm making great folds. Uh, obviously, as people know, I'm watching me. <laughs> well, we'll get into that in a bit. But one of the more importance that we were already important things we were already talking about is like. People can run better and worse than others. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not gonna lie, when I was younger, I definitely, you know, feel jealousy. It's been a really long time. I'd say over 10 years or maybe even 15 years where I even, I even care about somebody's run out. If somebody runs good in life, you know, more power to them. They run bad in life, I, I sympathize, but the public watching the poker world or the individuals grinding in the poker world are so obsessed with like these like upper end and lower end runouts when it's just like a lot of stuff you you can control but then at some point cards speak or opportunities speak so yeah it's uh a lot of the guys we see like garrett andy are pausing Dan Zach like they've gone through down swings much bigger than me I'm just, much like, bigger than me yeah I'm they're much bigger than me as well they're better they're better players than me and have it down swings but you know their run-ups they had certain opportunities and you can you're more likely to run good in those good opportunities but you can also run bad and that's you know 
I, I, yeah, it's I've on. been there for I, I I've been there with people who just I I've seen hands that could make or break somebody's life and go with the go the wrong way, you know, just hit some people hitting a two outer for like seven hundred thousand in equity when they're in makeup for like so much and if they hit if they won that hand they would have cleared their makeup and put three four hundred thousand in the bank or, you know, I've I bubbled a hundred I bubbled a one a one drop seat where if I got in who knows what I could have done or, you know I I've you know like I said in the main and, and cash certain cash games you lose a. You take a shot at 25, 50, no limit, and you get it in top set of kings on a king four deuce board versus a set of fours for 30k pot, and the guy hits a four on me. That happened to me, and now you're just to, just demoralized, and you just drop back down to five ten and grind, and like this is where I belong. It's like it's just it's a joke. Yeah. You, we, and many other, you know, players, poker players who relied on the outcome of poker for a good portion of our life always say poker's a joke in which it kind of is because it's like it isn't it isn't you know it's like it's it's a joke that it's a joke that you understand when i say that like yeah you know, i don't think it's actual joke but you know what i mean i'm yeah. like i'm like i'm 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 very conscious here i'm uh, i'm i'm very uh uh present here i'm just trying to i'm texting people the uh the link as as i'm listening to you at the same time to get more to get people involved and let people know i'm on here so they can tune in ask questions and, uh, yeah and um we're we're just trying to be real about this poker world because like when two thousand three Chris Moneymaker won, it was like anybody could do it. Anybody could get lucky. Not anybody can be consistently winning in poker for a long duration of time. Like the cards will inevitably screw you. And how yeah, you Yeah, if the guys it. like it's if you get a good deal, if you get something if you're like, you know, really you got a personality and you, you hit a big tournament and it doesn't doesn't like t say how good of a poker player, but if you get like a sponsorship deal at that point, you're set, you know. But the, in order to keep that sponsorship deal, you gotta, you know, guys like Chris Moneymaker will never, he'll be all right for the rest of his life for what he's done for the poker world, you know. Right. Um. So, but, but yeah, like you said, it's it's hard to just to grind and continuously be able to support yourself for 15, 16 years. We see how many people we see coming in out of the poker world, or how many people you see tell you they do it for a living but they got a roofing business or they got you know money coming in from being a trust fund uh recipient or you know uh they they whatever it might be they have money old money and they say they play professionally but you know that they're they, you, you, you're not keeping notes on people this but if you play in the game same game with them all the time you're like this guy's got something else going. i'm not gonna you know, it's really fire I, shots at particular people but i will the people that yeah. i have on the podcast like you, Sean Snyder, Bryce Yockey, you know, Andy, like Bryce Yockey's cool, man. I, yeah. I know Bryce. He's a good kid. All these guys were just like, you know, it, like take a hint of who I have on the podcast. It's like, we've been here, like I'm, I'm almost hitting 20 years. I think you're probably going to be hitting 20 years too. Yep. You know, soon. Soon. Yeah. yeah. I have my 20 year, my 20 year high school year in a, a reunion. It was last year. Like, well, this year, whatever, earlier this year. <laughs> because of the COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Just, no, 30, 38 and like, a week, two weeks, like to even last this long, or even to year five, you you have to be running like in the top, whatever, eight, nine, ten. I didn't hit the worst run of live cards I've ever seen until year sixteen. I was losing like literally every. I was dealt loser. Like, I every I, hand. I remember that. I remember I remember seeing you cut three four years ago, whatever, and we talked about that. You're telling me how you're just losing every hand. No. It, it's just like it's just, a, I, I've gone through worse runs online but you can play out of it when it happens to you live and you're literally yeah. dealt the losing hand like 90 percent plus maybe even 95 percent plus and literally everybody around you is like saying dude you're dealt losing hand like 95 percent plus it's good to hear because you know you're running bad but, well, you gotta. You have to also recognize like that actual person. Like, if you if you have respect for a player who's telling you that, then you know it's actually true. Because like, there's a lot of guys like Shannon Petluck, Shannon the Cannon. He's a LA. Like, he always losing. He's always losing. He's been fucking losing for 20 years, but he's making a living. And he he's a he's a pro. He's like he doesn't have any. Now I think he's. I love the guy. And he's watching this. I love Shannon. Shannon sure yeah. He's yeah, but he's like a depressed. He's always like, "Oh, I haven't won a hand. I'm losing every day." He just get kicked out every because you know he's a nutcase. But he's a good guy. But he's always losing. So like, 
And there's people that say I'm running so bad. I like you just know that they're bullshit. Like you're, just, you're probably playing bad. But this guy's like yourself, who's very aware of what the hell's going on, or something. I respect. like I'm like, like I'm like oh you are like that's you know it's brutal. And when you lose every single fucking day, you're like, am, am I? Is it something I'm doing wrong? But it's hard to realize that you actually are running, running really, really poorly, or you know you just try to like think of ways of avoiding the run bad. Like should I have, should I have played the ace jack suited? It? When somebody opened in the three hole, so I, maybe I should have fought. Like no, like you should have. You definitely have to play these hands, or you should definitely be doing this. And it's just like you said, you get dealt a loser. Second best. We're not talking about like, you know, third pair. We're talking about like you get dealt a, a nutty uh, you know, hand. The second, yeah, the a third nut flush versus nut flush on a, on a non paired board. Over and like over. Like eighteen yeah. times, over and over again. And you get dealt set over set. You get dealt a straight to a different straight, or somebody gutter hits. A, you get dealt like top pair second kick or king queen on queen seven three rainbow and some of you guys ace queen and you get them all the bets in or versus some guy who should never have it he's never had it versus anybody else but now he has it versus you you're like it's just like scenario after scenario and you go on a 30k downswing playing you know average of 30 60 limit hold them or mix or whatever you're playing it's like the moral it's like just the moralizing and just like it's hard to get your spirits up and and you're paying you're down you're on a 30k downswing and like like you said earlier in this conversation, you know, if you get the six figures, three, four hundred thousand, like, and you, I, it's like when you're so used to lifestyle, poker lifestyle, it's like the one good, the one great thing why people want to become a professional poker player. People watching, our life is like constantly eating the nicest restaurants or having access to like, you know, it, it's these casinos are always around. Nice, you know, we we want we want the nicest things. We like going out to to the nice dinners. We like. You know, uh, buying the nicest clothes, whatever it might be. Like, I like the party. I like going out, taking lavish vacations. In order to, you know, keep up that lifestyle, you you, you gotta do, you gotta win. So, but when when I run bad, I spend more money. When I lose, I I go out and I buy things. When I win, I don't buy anything. Hmm. I win. I just want to keep playing cards. When I go on a downswing, I want to go out and spend my money on other things. So when I lose, I'm losing everywhere. I'm like I'm like you know I can go on a 60k downswing in a month and a half, two months, like nothing like so dumb uh, that's that's what i mentioned too like i'm you know for a normal person yeah because i've been through the poker lifestyle i do i have spent in the past like worse than normal people but for a poker player i'm not that bad at all but the problem is in the poker vortex you start devaluing money so even though you're not spending more when you win that's not universal a lot of guys they win they spend money to celebrate and they lose they keep spending money to keep from feeling bad or to feel better about themselves and that's like the trap that's one of the traps in poker that this podcast with the legit people, you know, like yourself, would just like constantly just be like, you know, these are the pitfalls. We want, if you're determined to be a professional poker player, we do want people to do well and not be irresponsible. So with all these like 10 to 20 universal pitfalls, we want everybody to deal with them as best as possible. You're gonna screw up, everybody screws up. But hopefully we deal with it as well as possible. There's like, you know, Mike L, Bryce, Yaki, a bunch of people just eat the nicest stuff. It's really, really costly, of course, they gotta enjoy life, but definitely I hope these guys are honest and with the public and being like, this is not a good habit. All these Instagram pics, or just like the portrayal of the baller lifestyle, like this is not good. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, it's you mean by not good, it's not healthy. No, I mean I don't mean not, I mean that like being a professional. Mentally, was, no, no, no. Being a professional poker player does not entitle you to these things. These guys no. are like, yeah, yeah. They're trying to like, you know, Bryce Yaki is enjoying life, but he also treats his craft incredibly seriously. And it's him sure. rewarding himself, but it's like just because you're a pro doesn't mean you get these things. Like you have to be like strong, like Bryce, and you earn these things. Yeah, I wasn't eating at the nicest restaurants when I came around, and you know, like, you know, I, I'm fortunately I'm, I'm people like to you know engage and talk to me and have me around, and I, I I really am really grateful that people want to be around me and hang out with me. So I get invited to a lot of nice dinners, or you know, and we credit card roulette most of the time, and I've ran. I ran as good in credit card roulette than I did in poker. I'd be a million, That's, a multi million. Uh, I yeah. never, ever lose. I've been to Michelin star restaurants. Rest of the bills like three, four thousand, and I'm like, 
the six of us and I put my card in there and I just never lose. I've eaten some of the best meals and paid the, the, you know, free meals are the best meals. But uh, yeah, it's something you earn over time. You know, Bryce is, uh, you know, he's done a lot of work. He's a very, very smart kid. Very, and yeah. we can go off the subject of Bryce. We both lost a mutual friend uh, in Susie Zhao recently. Um, yeah. You know, it's been all over the news. I heard it's made international, I mean, like uh, national news and TMZ actually was uh, covering it and a lot of articles that came out and, you know, Susie was a, a really kind, from uh, my experience of Susie, she was very sweet, very nice to me. I've had the, I've had dinners heads up with her, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, five or six times in Vegas. You know, we, after a tournament, we both bust and go eat. And we became pretty good friends in 2016. She almost bought a piece of my house as an investment in 17. And that didn't fall through. Actually, I think Bryce told her that's not the greatest investment and whatever. I, I she asked me to do it and I said, sure. And it fell through. So, but uh, we, you know, I heard, you know, the last year and a half, she's had it pretty rough for two years and she, she was dealing with some mental health issues and, you know, uh, her life took a bit of a, uh, uh, you know, not the greatest turn and she was in uh, Miami before the cold, before the quarantine. And she, I, I didn't even know this. Like mutual friends told me she was down there. Um, you know, they, they interviewed like Bart Hansen and the kid, uh, what's his name? Um, there's a friend, I, I mean, we're, we're acquaintances, you know, the, the mixed game player who won a bracelet, uh, UV, Uv, Yuval Bronstein. I don't know. I, I probably like, know I by face. Really, yeah. But I didn't appreciate like, you know, he, he you kind of put Susie down. It's like, oh, she couldn't afford living in LA anymore. She, she moved out. Like, why do you have to mention that? Like, I got to be mad. Like, Bart did a really nice, you know, set of nice things about her. Just like, she's gone. You know, let's just talk about the good things about her. And like, I'm kind of contradicting myself and being kind of a hypocrite right now because I said she took a bad turn and she was dealing with some mental health issues. But I just want to let you know that the viewers, poker can be extremely you know, uh, taxing on your men and your men and your mental, like we're all, a lot of people are losing it on Twitter right now with COVID and, you know, the BLM movement and the child trafficking Like people are joining teams. Now I'm going off bit subject again. I know this is like an open conversation and we're just going all over the place, but go on. Anything. Just to yeah. Yeah. Just to touch up on that. Like black lives matter matters. Like it's definitely something that we should be talking about, something we should be supporting, you know, just the, the, the general message about it is like equality and people should have the right and not feel like they're being discriminated that's great but like you talk about that or you talk about covid and there's like this group like oh how about the forget that forget COVID. how about the kids that are being raped and being kidnapped for use for sexual trafficking and it's people with these the higher like 0.0001 percent are drinking these kids blood for like youth and there's all these like rings that we don't know about like why do we have to be on a team like People are like, oh, I'm not on the COVID team. I'm on the sex. I'm on the child trafficking team. Like, fuck COVID. That's a, that's what's going on on Twitter. Like, people are addressing like COVID posts. I wouldn't call them COVID deniers, but they're like, why can't everything matter? Why can't we attack all these problems? The child trafficking. Like, that's that's something I support. Like, I support putting an end to child trafficking. But why do I have to be combated if I talk about COVID with child trafficking link? Like, shut up, COVID. Child abuse like yeah that's real and it's something that no child should ever go through my heart bleeds for these kids but why does he why do you have to be in this it's like almost like people are in certain teams it's so weird like i said people are losing their minds on twitter and you know there's it, just the covid deniers the people that don't that are not compassionate to people that are passing and you know i, I recently tweeted something about people dying of covid and people are saying well they're like 74, they probably like had health issues or, you know, they had to be something else. Like it's attributing to like how many people are dying and they're saying it's COVID. Like, I'm sure that's happening, but shut the fuck up. Like, just like, where's your heart at? I know we don't know much about this virus, but like have some compassion, like, enough. Like I'm just, I just, people are making me sick. You know, people are, and I'm trying to stay off Twitter from my mental health, but like, I, I can't delete it. I'm on, I'm like, I'm a fiend to it. I go on there, I like scrolling through and see what my friends are doing, but it's toxic and it's, it's sad. And I just like, where's your heart at? Like enough. And then just, and my friend just died. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of death this month. My great, my great grandmother passed, my friend JP from my childhood passed, you know, uh, obviously Susie, who I was friends with was 
we don't even want to talk about how she died. You know, like that was just. Yeah. I hope that guy rots in hell. You know, nobody deserves to. to, to nobody deserves that kind of death. It's just so sad. You know, and uh, and then recently, my boy uh, A Game Rob. It was talk about A Game Rob. He was. He was in his 50s. He was living with my friend Kevin Colenzo, which is another tournament red grinder in the poker scene. 56, no pre-existing conditions. He was like 70, maybe 60 pounds overweight. Um, got got COVID. Was really having a tough time. Got tested for it. Didn't get the results back, but he had all the symptoms, like all the key symptoms, like you know headache, chest pains, cough, hit and smell, like couldn't sense of smell gone. And he was fighting it. They didn't go to the hospital. Plan on like he was getting he thought he was getting better. Like a lot of people with COVID said, "Oh, I'm feeling better." And then all of a sudden, two days later, it's just back to 100, 103 degree fever again. And he just died in his sleep. Like it, it just ended his life in his sleep. Like a lot of people hear that story and they're like, "Oh, they 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 almost want to make themselves feel better and be like, oh, but he probably had a heart condition or it's because he was overweight and he." I'm not overweight. Like, shut the fuck up. Like, enough. I don't like when people justify people's deaths to make themselves feel better because maybe it was this, maybe it was that. Like, we're losing lives here. Like, enough. Like, just, I, I, don't, I don't know. Let's just talk about poker and other things. <laughs> so I'm going to get worked up. No, this, this, is, this is important. And the thing is, social media, because we could choose who we follow and who we block, we create our own echo chambers. And just like a lot of people, they want their cognitive biases to succeed. They don't want to listen to the other side. They just want to like talk of and to like, I don't know. We've known each other for like 15 years. I don't know what's going on with your life. You don't know what's going on. My, I guess you could tune in and get a piece of it like through live at the bike or something, but whatever we're individually going through, we don't really know until we like reconnect, like we meet up. You know, and we just like talk about it, and, and you have to care. You have to care to know, you, and you, you can easily see if somebody's actually cares. Like I've been able to, to to weed out and realize if somebody's just listening, or they're just hearing me, or they're not listening. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, they care, and like, I don't, I don't get mad when people don't care. It's just like they have their own thing, or they, you know, I, I don't take press. It, like, it's fine. So I try to like, you, you know, you have to be very careful. You share certain information with, but I'm a very like I said, like I'm. I'm all now. I'm like all cards up, face up. When I talk when I talk about life these days, it could be a weakness at some point, but I I consider it a strength mostly. Like I'm face up. Here we go. What I got. This is what I'm going through. This is my life. You want to be a part of it? You want to talk about it? We can talk about it. Maybe I can things that I'm going through can hopefully help better your like help you figure some things about your life, or we can learn from each other. I'm always about just becoming a better person, you know, and just in and outside of poker and just helping people that are going through similar things if it's you know if anything that i've gone through that i can help you give you some kind of shortcut you know i don't i don't i don't never call myself a life coach but i have a lot of friends who reach out to me for advice all the time you know and they just want my advice about you know how to approach certain matters if it's relation women issues relationship issues health issues you know nutrition you know uh being able to time block you know priority and what to give your energy to and traveling and i'm just i'm just ready i'm ready to you know i'm ready to continue the second half of my life dude and i'm happy that you uh, uh have me on here to talk about it you have unlimited access to me you know that but we we want to talk about uh an issue that you have your very opinion about and you just mentioned like 15 seconds ago women dating while you're a professional poker player <sighs> yeah it's, it's, it's like if you live that tournament life like Aaron Massey and his brother Ralph and a lot of players, you know, constantly on the road, it's extremely hard to have a, a, a really a meaningful relationship. Like, it's hard to find a girl that's going to be all right with you leaving for like, like, hey, babe, I'm going for three weeks and come back for a week. I'm going for another two weeks. That's not me. I don't travel a tournament circuit like I did in my 20s. Right now, I've been saying this for the last three or four years. <clears throat> Obviously, Survivor and COVID have put in <clears throat> choking on water. Sorry, <clears throat> to put a halt in like what I want to do. But I want to put some roots in the ground, be part of a community, you know, <clears throat> join a fucking 
a garden club or some sort. <coughs> I'm obviously just making, just making things up, but dating in the poker world is hard. You know, my whole life I've dated, you know, people who got, who understood me, poker dealers, massage therapists, uh, cocktail waitresses, somebody who's, who understands, who understands what you do because it's, when you meet somebody who's a, a, a normal person, <coughs> they don't understand. They, they tell me a professional poker player and if they have somebody in their family who, who's had issues with gambling, like everybody has that degenerate uncle who's lost his life at the craps table, who bets crazy sports and, you know, is a failure in terms of like, you know, their priorities and it's it's been they have to go to like AAA like gambling meetings like my uncle he had to he went to like I don't know it's not it's it was a GAA or gambling and not G I don't know GA I don't know my uncle went my mother's my mother's brother had a gambling issue and he lost his house he lost his money so it, it's a touchy subject with him he he's like even though he knows I'm successful he's like this is no life to live like and it, you know, it's very true. Like a lot of, it's very rare for people to raise a family through this. And like, you know, the David Baker's out there, the Marco, crazy Marco's out there. The, there's a lot of people that are able to, you know, Matt Samazic to, to set a schedule, get up at nine, like, get up at six in the morning, go to the gym, come to the commerce, work from 10, start a game, 10 a.m., play till, you know, four in the afternoon, try to beat traffic, get out, play till seven some nights, raise their kids, their wife, has a normal job so they get the benefits and they live a really fruitful life. Like I know there's a lot of these examples. So for me, I, like I said, we talked about this earlier in this, in this conversation. I don't, I want to put bo poker on the back burner at some point and do it as an enjoy, as a recreational thing at some point in my life and still obviously compete at the highest levels and try to win as much money as I can. But I, I feel like, you know, doing something else could be conducive to meeting somebody who's you ultimately want to be with and start a business with and start a just start an empire with and just move forward and, and like find that true that person that fits you but like there's nothing wrong with dating cocktail a cocktail waitress or a poker dealer they're all beautiful human beings as well and i've had some really good relationships and it was easier they knew what i was doing we worked on the same schedule they were able to travel and get the time off you know off of work so it worked out i dated a poker player for two years that was it was fun, but I don't rec I wouldn't I don't think I'd do that again. I'd like to have some kind of separation from my job and you know, so dating in the poker dating in poker has been fun for me. I've I've had a lot of cool relationships and it's it's been a roller coaster ride. Uh at the end of the day, you know, uh yeah. I don't know what else to say. I think I covered a lot there. <laughs> well, let's definitely talk about the pitfalls of one two poker players dating and two dating somebody within the same industry because i think that those two things are more universal it's good to have some separation i think dating somebody in the same industry you kind of know the same people your friends kind of intercross you're, you're just in each other's business all the time yeah is it nice to come home and talk about a bad beat and having my significant other know what i'm talking about have some kind of grasp yeah, but I'm not like I don't come home and be like you should have believed this guy. Like when I when I tell my like the girl that I'm dating, I just tell them like I don't tell bad beast stories. I tell actual like interactions with different humans that I just find them be the nut low and just be like this guy. You believe this guy said this to this waitress or did this or you know he owes this person money. He's not paying and he's a scumbag. Or and I say nice things about people obviously all the time as well. But the the, the drama people want drama so, and we all like drama as much as people say they don't like drama. They like, they like hearing about it. They don't like being in it. <laughs> yeah, oh, like, you know, red flag is a girl on Facebook talking about, I'm tired of this drama. I don't want any drama. Like, they love the drama. People don't know how much they like drama. The ones who say they don't like drama, we're always continuously telling people, I don't like drama, like drama. Oh! This is what I learned, what I learned over the years. But, like, you know, dating another poker player, for me, uh, she was really good. Uh, her name was One. We were like in a pretty toxic relationship in and out you know but she was really good at poker and we traveled a lot together you know it it it, it, it was in the time like four years ago we, we had a great time we did it for a year and a half uh 
But at the end of the day, it was it was. You know, she's dating somebody that has nothing to do with poker now, and I'm I'm happy for her. Uh, but uh, it was rough. You know, I know there's a lot of poker couples out there that are doing great. You know, doing really well, like uh, Katie Stone, you know, Jamie Kurtzetter, you know, uh, Marley. I don't know. If she's she's not with that Sparagi character anymore. She's not. But, uh, oh, she, I don't think oh she is. <laughs> I thought they were. She put some tweet out that was stated that she wasn't. Or something. Oh, maybe it was I, a joke. Maybe. I don't. I don't. Keep I don't know this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know her personally. I just see these things on Twitter. But like, I, I'm all for po- oh, like oh like Alex Foxen and fucking yeah, Christy Christy Bicknell. Bicknell. Yeah. Oh, that's Definitely. like she's like the she's like the dream like they're the dream couple like they're both good people. I have met I've I you know I I don't know them that I know Alex a little more than her, but I have interactions with both of them. They're just really good individuals and. You know, there's something to strive for. If you want a poker relationship, there's a lot of positives. If you can, if you can navigate and manage through all that, great. You know, more power to you. It's not like I'm telling people I don't recommend it. From my personal experience, you know, I've had some rough times dating. Uh, I dated like two different girls who were in poker. For me, I just like to, you know, like my girl doing her thing, her project. I'm doing my project. We can talk about our. We support each other. Yeah. You know. It's like when I dated one, she would be like, you know, you play that hand terribly, or you're an idiot, or something, and it's just like, what? We, what? we <laughs> talked, we talked about this, yeah. I think the two biggest like, pitfalls, uh, one where you just talked about is like when things are going bad, and then the per- when they already have to deal with things going bad, and then you people well intentioned try to critique or you know give their opinion then it just like boom it's just like 5x 10x the pain well you know it's sick like, that's like that's like going back to dating somebody who doesn't know anything about poker when you go when you, like when i date somebody that has nothing to do with poker they ask me how i did how'd you do today babe i did great every single time i did well no matter if i lost fucking four thousand or i made seven thousand it's always the same reaction i did well because they can't deal with the swings. They have no like yeah. to them. It's like you lost six thousand today. Oh my! Like they just think you have an issue. Every problem. Like they don't realize. They don't understand the swings of poker. It's at the end of the month or at the end of the year. Like I made one hundred and sixteen thousand playing forty eighty. I made, you know, one hundred and six an hour playing eighteen hours, uh, eighteen hundred hours. Like you show them this graph, but they just. I don't want them to deal with the stress. I already have enough. I already. I already learned how to deal with the stress over like the course of the seventeen years I've been doing it. Yeah, that's my life. When you act like so, so, I don't want to be mean. Like, don't ask me how I did, because then you just, you know, it's really hard. I talked to a lot of people, dated poker players, like girls with dated poker players who aren't in poker, and they tell me that poker players sh- like it shows on them. If they're running good and they're, and they're doing well, they're a lot happier to be around. They're a lot yeah. more nicer. They're 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 like really cool. But when they're doing terrible, they take their anger out on them, and that that's that's just giving us a bad rap. Like I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm the same person all the time, but my, my I move like this, you know. This is how I move, like just like this. You you can't really tell. If I'm down five to four thousand and in the forty eighty game if I lied to you, it's gonna be hard for you to realize that, like right away, unless I tell you. And I, I my gauge is like this, but some people like from here to here, and I don't like a lot of these people. Like they got like. That, you know, you see it a lot in LA. Somebody's like the, the most degenerate dudes up 4Ks. Like, hey, baby, I know that. I love you. Oh, I've been good. Tipping everybody, tipping the floor. And then he's down 4,000. He's calling the dealer a whore in Arabic or in Farsi or in Vietnamese or in English or in Hebrew or in whatever native language. And I know the words. It's like, that's somebody's grandma. That's somebody's mom. That's somebody's daughter, sister. What is wrong with you? They just like, you can easily tell if somebody's doing well, and and that's it translates to relationships. I mean, in, in any job, if you're like, don't bring, you know, don't bring your your job home to your cup to your other significant other, and like, sure, couples are there to take each other's stress and be somebody to lean on, but you really got to learn how to channel that energy and and know like, hey, this is the life we chose, dude. Like, calm down. Like, like Shannon's awful at that, right? We go back to Shannon, He's screaming at people, throwing shit, he gets kicked out of casinos all the time. Like, what is fucking wrong with you? What? And I'm just grateful to be somebody who knows how to take the swing and knows how to handle the emotions and stress. It's something to be said. Like a lot of people do. A lot of people are very mild mannered. I'm very. I can be abrasive and obnoxious sometimes. I got that East Coast accent. I'm all over the place. But 
I pride myself, I've learned how to deal with the swings. And you don't bring that home to your spouse. You don't bring that home to, like, you know, if somebody does bad, they come home and, you know, they fucking kick the dog. Like, it's not the dog's fault. Leave the dog alone. It's beautiful. What are you doing? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. all, all these things. Plus, like, when both people in a relationship are in the poker industry and they're on a downswing, <sighs> that's, and it's going to happen. There's good things about dating a poker player. You're, you're, you're doing, you're on a downswing. They understand you're sick. You're really good at poker. You're running terrible. They're doing well. They buy Whole Foods that week. They take care of the bill. Like, hey, don't, baby, I got this dinner. That's what, what, what's dating one was great. She, she was, you know, she loved Michelin. I'm not a, I like eating well, but she loved like being at Robachon or, you know, Uchi at Vegas and going to all these like Michelin star restaurants and spending a thousand on dinners. Like, I'll spend 300 on a dinner. Like, I'll go to Echo and Rig and like Zuma or, you know, these great steakhouses and seafood places in Vegas and I'll, I'll splurge two, three hundred, but like, I don't, I, I enjoy going to a tasting menu restaurant once a year, but I don't need this every fucking, she loved it. But when she ran well and I ran bad, she would pay for things. She would be like, I'm going to take care of this. You're running terrible. And vice versa. She had her own money. She did really well. She had like a, she had like a deal with some on, uh, online Euro uh, sites making like tons of money in rake back. So it came to fi the financial between me and her. She was, my hat's off to her. She, uh, with money, she was great. You know, a lot of people, and I'm not, I don't want to be, you know, sound uh, chauvinistic here, but, you know, a lot of guys have gotten ruined from certain women staking them. And a lot of girls have gotten ruined from guys. I, I know a lot of girls who got taken advantage of and, and, and other poker players use their money and, and they share the same bankroll. And if girls have gotten burned, guys have gotten burned. It's just like, keep your shit separate. You can buy pieces of each other. Do You know, we always kept our money separate. Me and, which was, we were good with money. Everything else, like, we just didn't blend as forget poker. We just didn't, we weren't the right match. That's why that ended. And then, being in the same industry as someone, obviously it's very convenient. A lot of people date within their own industry, but I guess one of the pitfalls when you get older is just like you you kind of know where they stand in their in, in the industry, and you know where you stand, and it gets kind of like stale. Mm -hmm. Everybody's been a lot different. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been a lot of successful that. relationships. There's definitely no a lot of rules. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, Freddie Deeb had, had dated a dealer and had uh, Jeannie, Janine Deeb, who's a great girl. And she's a baby now with her husband. And a lot of great relationships that came out of, like, into, like you know, you date people in the industry, and that this just makes sense. You know, rapport builds, you get you, you know that person, you know who they are. And there's been a lot of beautiful relationships that, like, you know, Matt Savage, you know, got married to a girl on the floor that he was working with or a dealer at some point or whatever. And these things, you see them everywhere, you know, like, and it just, it just, it just makes sense. It's definitely positive. I'm just like, there can yeah. be pitfalls. That's like when, it's like, you know, when you want to enter an industry, you're passionate about an industry, you're driven, you usually only see the positives or you only want to see the positives. And then the negatives, like, you should listen to industry veterans like there's podcasts like this or just articles about like yeah like, nothing's perfect right everybody everybody has their flaws you know you just gotta you deal with you, if you really love a person you really care about them you deal with their flaws and you, you try to make each other better you know you you shouldn't look for somebody to to attach on to or latch on to to make yourself feel better about yourself you should just look at another now now we're just giving a dating advice just like Find somebody who, who like will support you. You'll support them, and you'll grow together, and you'll become better people together. You make each other better. It, it shouldn't be a one-sided thing, and that goes in any industry, any profession. Uh, it's just my advice, you know. Just uh, you know, girls are always, you know, they, they and guys are trying to, you know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say things I'll regret. So let me just, let me just back off here. Leave the. Um. All right. Well, the. Poker Stars Shark Cage. How did it lead up to getting on the show? I think a lot of a lot okay. of people. It, it's good knowledge for people to understand how you get on these, you know, great shows and the process of going through it. You know, it's obviously playing on camera, and we talked about this too. Playing on camera is different from playing off camera. Oh yeah, I mean, I made a fool out of myself on camera. 
I uh, run it up Reno recently. I just got this kid with a Mickey Mouse shirt. I forgot his name. He just ruined me, and I just like, I wasn't all there mentally. I was going through. I was like the beginning of coming back from Survivor. I wasn't feeling well, and I just. But yeah, let's go back to Shark Cage. Uh, 2014, I cashed the main event five years in a row, and I was getting a lot of. I got like a whole episode on W on ESPN and WSOP. It was like me and Phil Ivy, like Ivy and me. It was great. Like, and I was on Ivy Poker at that point. And I was hanging out with Phil a lot. We are partying a lot, so that was, like, a really good time in my life. I was in my prime. Not that I'm out of my prime now, but, you know, 2014, I was 31. That's, like, you know, it's a male's prime. I was, like, just loving life, and things were great. And so Poker Stars, you know, kind of approached me, and I knew a, a few guys who worked behind the scenes. Uh, one of my really, really good friends at the time put a good word in for me, Gary Gates. And uh, was Gary, shout out to Gary Gates. Shout out to Gary Gates. I uh, love the guy. He works for DraftKings now. He's doing big things. He's getting married soon. Going to his bachelor party next month in, in Tahoe. It's going to be like a, out, everything's outdoors, like a social distancing bachelor parties kind of fun trip. But uh, he put in, he was a big believer of mine, always been a big believer of mine. He always says, you're a star, man. You should be on every fucking show. You should do this. So he put a good word in for me. They sent me an email. You know, they're looking for diversity. And, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a brown guy. And I, like, I got, you know, some, I'm different. So I got on the fucking show. And then I remember flying to Barcelona, like, last minute. I stayed with Donnie Peters. I was with Donnie Peters. And the show was, like, the next day, kind of jet-lagged. Met Sarah behind the scenes. We're getting makeup. We, what we had in common was she's half Moroccan, and I'm half, Mor I'm a half Moroccan Jew. Her mom was, like, Moroccan Muslim, whatever. Moroccans are Moroccan. And she... I kind of want to get a feel for what, because she was a celebrity on the show. So the show's premise, like, four four poker four poker pros, one qualifier, and some kind of celebrity model, sports athlete, actor, like John Cheadle, and rugby star, and, like, you know, the, that famous soccer player who plays a lot of poker. Uh, uh, what's his name? Played for FC Barcelona or whatever. I mean, he's a huge name. Can't think of it right now. But anyways, she was our celebrity. Star. Yeah. Star. So, what I gained from her is that she had some poker knowledge. She made day two of a tournament that just happened. Astraeus, the main event, I couldn't make it up for her because I got the team later. Just got there the day before. And her boyfriend played. She, they played together a lot. So, I'm like, all right, this girl, she knows who poker is. She understands poker. Okay, so, we start to play. The first hand dealt was the hand that everybody's seen. And I, I... I mean, I can go over the hand if you'd like, but I, while it was going on, my my perception of her, my assessment of her was that she knew the rules, but she wasn't good. And I I never thought she would able to play the hand the way she played it. Like, I bet the flop, I let bottom pair, she clicked it, she like min raised me, I gave her a queen X right away, I called, I turned trips, bingo, you know, I checked, she bet 50K, normally, versus people that are comp like really good or competent, I would just call, keep bluffs in their range. Versus like somebody like her, I'm like, she has a queen. She's never folding. If I make it small, 150, she's gonna call, river's gonna brick. I'm gonna, like, no, no queen. I'm just gonna bet like 185, 200. She's in like value. Keep like make sure she still has like a half of her stack. And I'm gonna profit nice in the hand. Make it 150. She's like, she does something like num num num. She says num 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 num. And she like looks at the deal, she looks at the chip, she's like I raise, like record, like people who don't like. She, she clicked it back on me. and made it two fifty, and like, normally if it's not on TV, I would just like sat there kind of quietly. And maybe not. Maybe versus her, I would have been as as, not as you know vocal as I was on TV on that show, but pretty vocal even if it was off camera because of the, the, the dynamic. But she's a wreck, and I could like talk to her in the middle of the hand, and but. I'm like, okay, maybe she's just doing this because when you raise somebody who doesn't have much experience, they just hear raise and whatever they have, they're like, I want to raise too. I'm going to re-raise you. I'm going to re-raise you. She makes that 100 more. So that's what I was thinking. I'm like, all right. And I'm obviously trying to think of a range she has. I'm like, just, either I'm fucked or she's still just playing a queen terribly here and she just thinks like this is the best hand. So I'm going to re-raise you. Call. Fine, call. And I have like 700,000 behind. Or make six eighty five or something. Stupid like that. And the pot was about what I what what I had. It was like six fifty or something in the middle. 
was two fifty a piece, and then you know sixty k, one hundred six twenty in the pre flop. Yeah, like six fifty in the middle. And then the river is you know the board's queen five four four. I turn trip fours, and the river's like a six. It brought seven eight, or deuce three, I think. So I checked, and she just thought for a second and looked at me. And she goes, she smiled. She's like, all in. And if you watch the video, there's times where she looks a little nervous, but I'm not looking at her at that times. And obviously if I was looking at her, it's easier to see what, like people watching, it's, you know, when you're playing poker, you can tell if somebody's bluffing when you're out of the hand, a lot easier when you're in the hand. Yeah. A lot easier seeing from the, when you don't have that pressure on you, like, dude, like, you know, you're sitting there and you're like hoping this person called like, oh, that guy's bluffing. So, but when you're faced with like $4,000 bet on the river and five, or like a 10, 20, no limit, like the pressure's on you, it's harder to really, like those are the makes that separates the best from the worst. Like you don't, yeah. like you just able to read, assess the moment even with that pressure on. You. So when she goes all in, and I'm on, I'm, I'm on like no sleep, and like it's the first hand dealt. I don't know much about this girl. I don't think she has the capabilities just to go off to fucking spaz, to go all in. Like, so I just thought about it. Like, is it worth it calling off and just being out? First place is a million dollars, and this is a sit and go format. Like, I still have. 70 big blinds. You start with 100 big blinds. I still have 70 big blinds. I can come back from this. And I did. After she bluffed me and then she showed the infamous bluff and everybody's laughing about it till this day, I got back. We watched the whole episode. I bust Eugene Kachaloff, who's the best player at the table. And now I have like 1.3 million and I have a chance at it. And I was able to like, but you know, it was a turbo. Things got pretty fast. Obviously, if I busted her, we'd never be talking about this. It was the hand would have been probably, I might have got some views because it was funny. But. You know, it is what it is. I'm really proud of the yeah. moment. Yeah, it showed my personality. It helped me get on Survivor. They they love that clip, you know. And uh, yeah, it was just it was fun. Hand. Yeah, and it's, it's like you know, obviously I feel bad that you get trolled so much. Obviously, when I needle you, it's a total joke because <laughs> we're friends. But like when you get needled yeah, by a stranger, yeah. I don't take anything personal anymore, especially with this chick with Sarah Hand. It's just, I always laugh. It gets a little stale and old when, like, people call me Miss Finland and they, like, walk into a room. Yeah. Miss Finland. And it's like, uh, no, they just say it because, like, it's, they like, oh, you're the guy Miss Finland. But sometimes I sit in the guy in the game and some dude's, like, calling me Miss Finland. And like, it's kind of corny. <laughs> like, dude, whatever. But, like, I have to be a good sport about it because I don't want to let it get right. to me. It's, like, corny. Like, shut the shut, dude, you're corny. Like, they're like, oh, it's Miss Finland. Me and Miss Finland heads up or something. Oh, that's actually what I said in the middle of that hand. But, you know, people will just say stupid things to me. And it's like, it's funny, but people just beat a dead horse over and over and over again. Like, are, are you happy to play with me? Fine. Whatever. You can keep calling me, Miss Finley. Keep joking with me. It's been fucking sick. It's been six years. I mean, the hand came out like five, like five years ago. It's been like literally it's like August 19th or something today or whatever. Today might be the anniversary. Really? Well, that would and be it, a... Ten, like... No. Shouts to anniversaries. <laughs> They should get us back together and do like a heads up match. Sure, you, you can know? do it on live. They <laughs> should have done it. They should have. I think yeah. she lives in L. I think she lives in L. A. I tweeted at her, didn't respond. Whatever. I'm sure she has no idea who I am or or whatnot. But she's not even on Twitter anymore. She hasn't tweeted since like two years ago. So. Oh well. I mean, she sir. Follow, I mean, she follows me on she follows me on Instagram. I can send her a message. We talk once. We still talk. Sure. We talk like twice a year. You know, because I can. You know, if 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 it ever was a thing. I'm sure she'd want to like, you know, she doesn't want to, she's like a pretty high, you know, high end model. Like she's, she's big time and I'm sure she's not going to put her own dime. I'm just like, you got to fucking put, if you want to put me up a thousand, I'll put your heads up on TV, you know, like get paid for it. She's not going to do shit for free. Of course. So yeah. like get a lot of, but yeah, I, I think it would get, she, that'd be funny. She had like, you know, she was like rapping in some videos. Music you ever see that rap video? It's so, it's so funny. So it's fun. It's good. It's a good video, but you know. It's like the way she hyped herself up, I didn't even understand. Like she, it's before she's coming on the rap, like before she does a rap, she's like doing some kind of like squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. It's like I don't know, some kind of Finnish language. It's, it's I'm not, I don't want to make fun of the Finnish language, but this is funny. Here, it's like hearing Korean like pop. You know, like I think it's funny. It's just like it's, it's, it's cool. I appreciate my it stuff. Like hearing like <laughs> yeah, hearing like boys to men version of like you know Jap Japanese boys to men. It's like just funny to me i don't know why i'm laughing at it i just think differently like hearing different rap languages it's just like i, I find it i appreciate it but it's also funny. a lot of it's just like especially in art forms whether it's like music movies 
like a lot of it is just really the nature versus nurture it's, you know we're all we all grew up in like a different ethnic culture and then you know in america it's like we all gotta try to get along yeah well it's not really happening much right now but <laughs> that's 2020 um, but yeah. it's one of the things like if you have a homogeneous more homogeneous culture like if you're in china or you're in south korea or you're in finland or in italy it's like you're all dealing with the same people and then then when you collide with another culture then it's a little rougher but you know growing yeah up, we set the prep well america sets like we when they set we set the example for you know this whole huge melting pot for the world to take like a lot of people say it sucks living in america it, we we have we have it better no. than you think in terms of like it's a great country. We live in a great country. We have a lot of problems that we need to resolve right now. And, yeah. You know the people that say all continue with this all lives matter thing. Of course, all lives matter. Well, it, it's 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 pretty evident. It's pretty known when people say all lives matter. You're throwing shade at Black Lives Matter. You're just like, well, all lives matter. Like, we understand all lives matter. It's like picture two burning houses and one is just always on fire and the others are doing fine, and you're just watering that house saying, well, all houses matter. Well, it's not even on fire. How about the one that's on fire? That's a, that are dealing with a lot of like issues, and it, it, it's just I, we don't have to get into that. But it's just it's tough to not stuff to talk about. Like I'm not, you know. But uh, but yeah, it's just uh, we're it's America. It's like like you said, living in a country where it's like 98. If you live in Italy, you know a lot of Italians all the time, you know. And if you're in Kenya, you're a lot a lot of Kenyans. If you're in like it's, it's I don't know, it's, it's tough. I, 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 pro I love, I have friends from A to Z, bro, you know, and I get along with everybody and I, I love that. I love, I love different, I love culture. I love different people. I love different cuisines and different food and, you know, there's so many ignorant people out there that just are just blind to so many different things and don't want, like, they don't want to. They don't want to learn about other people and that's fair, like, whatever. If that's what they want to do, they don't want to, they don't care for other, for other race or you know issues and stuff they don't they're selfish or can they even call them selfish Wayne they don't they don't, they don't care about like you know other people and it's that's what, that's what they choose to live their life it's just really hard there's over 7 billion people on this planet I think we're hitting 8 billion like pretty soon and there's over 3 billion I think over 3.5 billion people on the internet we all have biases and to our our own existence mm -hmm. and then when people start imposing their biases and their lives on other people when it doesn't ne it doesn't necessarily apply or they're living in a completely different world than you take for example like live at the bike or me propping at the bike the bike is a very nice casino in the grand scheme of casinos it's definitely on the upper it's, end it's really nice yeah, especially since a new renovation as well it's pretty it's pretty nice right so i have this like warped perceptive that i forget that the rest of the casino industry is not like this because uh live of the bike is so stable i forget other poker shows have issues that live of the bike tries to resolve you know over and over and there are less problems than the, there were before because we work on them but the world series even though they've been around longer excuse me they're only active like a couple months in the year so they do what they can and the world series obviously does a great job but in those eight months nothing's really going on where live the bikes just you know more consistent mm -hmm. um i love the i love the world series of poker they, they still a lot of things they can improve on but nothing's perfect yeah. i mean i love the their online site is just it's right it's just it, it's, online stuff yeah and even right before we started this podcast literally there were technical difficulties of things that just never happened wrong and I'm just like sitting here trying to fix it, and then you know, shout out to you, just like patiently waiting. You're like, don't worry about it, and then you know, everything comes back online. And you have to make do with what you have. Like we plan to put in like you know the Miss Finland video, and shout out to the your, the buddy you're staying with with the seven dogs. But we got to get the yeah, show going. Yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, hit hit Living Foundation is uh, my friend's. She uh, she runs a rescue. You know, if you if you're out there and you want a, a, a companion, there's tons of dogs that need foster or need a new home. If you even want to foster a dog for a few months, there's so many dogs that could use a temporary home until they find 
an owner. You know, it's the Hit Living Foundation. She's my really good friend. You know, her name is Heather. She's an amazing person. And right now, I'm, I'm staying with them in LA. She has seven dogs. That's, that's those are her dogs, and uh, you know, she's done so much for for puppies all over the. She usually she's getting a lot of dogs now out of Tijuana and just rescuing dogs. From, she's like just like that person that. We just need more people like her. She's like goes on rescue trips to the Bahamas when they had that huge hurricane and wow. just taking dogs and spending any dollar she makes. She just like to a point where like you know I'm like hey do you have food you know are you okay? She'll just give her she gives her fucking shirt off her back to animals like she just just does everything for 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 uh, canines. She just loves dogs and you know so if you're out there and you want to foster a dog in the L.A. or Vegas Scottsdale Phoenix wherever you are in this kind of western southwest. You can you can Twitter you can ha- holler at my Twitter if you want a dog if you want, or if you want to make a donation to the foundation you know uh, they always uh, take taking donations uh, to help feed these dogs and most of the donations go straight to medical bills to help them you know uh, deal with uh, any illness or or surgeries that are needed you know she took in a dog that is blind right now is, her eyes have to come out she literally has no eyes wow. she's in the video that I we could have posted but I'll post it I'm gonna post a video just on my Twitter and shout them out. Um, We're going to post a link happy. below. Post a link below. So, Yeah, the Hit Living Foundation. Did I send it to you? you have uh, it, right? we'll, we'll take care of it after, and I'll, I'll okay. edit, the, edit the details, so there's a link below. Yeah. But, yeah, we have just, like, all for all the people that complain about operations and the World Series of Poker is the biggest victim of this, once you start, like, running operations... You see how hard it is and how many things can go wrong. I had it on the Kathy Zhao podcast with the, she's a WPT Deep Stacks director. Like there are literally so many moving pieces just to get it running. Any one thing or multiple things can happen wrong. And the people running the operations have to recover while the public or the people involved are just like screaming at you. Bashing at them, yeah. Like, yeah, a lot of, like, you know, I give props to the WCP for, like, just running that huge festival. And there's a lot of things they do great, and there's some things they do bad. And it just, they're going to be open to constructive criticism and to opinions and to, and to suggestions. And they do a good job listening. I mean, like, we have to feed our, like, through Daniel Negreanu or, you know, through guys that they, like, look to help, like, who just, they listen to. Is it, like, I have some pull of the World Series of Poker. They follow me. Like, they only follow, like, 350 people. Like, that's so I, that's cool. So if I say some things, people ask me, oh, can you do this? Can you do that? Or, I can go right to, you know, to Jack Effel or to, to some of the big TDs and say, hey, we should do this, we should do that. And they'll listen to me because they know I've been around forever. Right. So, but like, they, you know, they do this best as they can. There's a, a lot more things. Like, I, I mean, I wish the MGM just fucking bought the World Series of Poker and it was at the Mandalay Bay every year. It's the best best location for it. They have such the huge, the biggest convention rooms. It's right off the end of the high, end of the 15, away from everything else in the strip. There's rumors that's going to be at the link behind like where the link is that's gonna be a disaster what mm. caesar's next year i don't think it's like they were supposed to this was supposed to be the last year for the rio 2020 mm. uh unfortunately obviously we have no world series of poker this year online you know? so <laughs> yeah online yeah it's a whole nother but yeah you know. definitely uh once you start doing operations you start uh sympathizing and just like how how difficult it is and appreciating anything that comes up and in live the bike there are tons of problems we try to fix things one by one you know and like Mm -hmm. once the problems start getting smaller or or disappear you just stop hearing about them but only the people internally building the show really feel that alleviation um and just like you know what happens when you solve one problem guess what you move on to the next one or you start building yeah. the next product and then you know it's it's like like you mentioned your your soul's a little missing when you sit down at the table to grind building something you your soul gets invigorated having these podcasts with you after knowing you all these years that you know gets me up when i'm feeling shitty not rolled up aces over kinks <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean the satisfaction and the, the I get from playing poker is obviously being able to you know being able to provide for myself and uh, doing good things for, for my friends and family like being able to help my dad and you know buying him a house and you get you get makes you feel good helping people that you know that are like that need your help or you know taking care of your your loved ones and such but yeah sometimes you feel empty I've been that emptiness has been more 
prominent over the last couple of years. More, it's, it's, it's I feel a lot more. So, but uh, you know, COVID doesn't help, and uh, no. you know, quarantine and all this being alone. No, I just had to take a trip. You know, I just did a long road trip uh, from. I went through nine states in the Northwest, went to five I've never been to, which was really cool. Uh, and I never visited Washington State, Oregon, uh, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Brought that, that crossed off the list, and I went to so many national state parks. I, the, the fucking RV business is booming right now. Every campground is reserved. Families are getting out. It's like the best time to do it. You want to be outdoors. You want to be in indoors with COVID. And, you know, a lot of people are uh, are traveling right now in within the states and within these national parks. They're just flooded on the weekends. You can't move. But uh, yeah, it's I just. You know, I know this. A lot of people are struggling um, with depression and anxiety, and just know that a lot of people are as well. You're not the you're not alone. Yeah. And there's a lot of there's a lot of help out there if you seek it. You know, reach out and, and the people that are doing fine that are listening, reach out to friends, man. See how people are doing. You know, you never know. One phone call could be the difference. You know, you could really help somebody out. And, you know, it, it, sometimes save a life. You know, it show somebody you care. People miss people. Real people don't realize like how many people love them or what they're you know, like. They they miss they miss it. Like they lose train. They lose thought of like actually how important they are to some other people. Like this, you know. So just reach out to a friend and make can make the world a difference. You know, it can really can. So, were you a heads up guy? Are you into the heads up scene or not really? Yeah, I, I mean, I like heads up limit hold them. I like heads up no limit hold. I mean, like I play a lot of heads up and limit hold them. Uh, heads up limit hold them like fucking war. You know, it's it's so fun. Uh, I'm not. I don't pride myself on being a good heads up no limit player whatsoever. I, I would get eat by somebody. Knew, if somebody knew what they were doing, they would just ultimately crush me. You know, like I know my role. You know, like I know what I'm good at. Like we talked about prior. Like just know what you're good at. I like short handed and limit hold them. Short handed and low limit, six handed, five handed, four handed. Okay. Anything less than that, I just sit out. I don't really, unless I'm like playing with people that don't really know what they're doing, then I feel okay. But if somebody, if there's one player in a three-handed game or four-handed game, they're gonna crush me. Like, you know, I just get, I'll just get three bad spots. I have no idea what to do. If I should be four batting or just flatting and check raises and fly. I just, I don't know what I'm like. I'm not a heads-up specialist. I'm not a short-handed no-limit specialist. Short-handed limit hold them. I'll, I'll play against almost anybody. Um, some different, like I like horse. Uh, short-handed horse is fun. But uh, the heads up scenes are interesting, you know. People playing for roles and shit all the time. I see Garrett playing for like millions of dollars in the corner, like off stream, just like playing with random people all the time. Never seen, you know. Good for him; he's crushing. So it's an interesting world. Uh, I don't know if this is the grindy with that poke challenge is going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's going to happen, which is is great for the poker world. Like a lot of cool things. Like first, uh, you know, the Galfon challenge, and then him coming back. Yeah, that's cool. So big from against Vendaviti. And then um, Helmuth versus Esfandiari, I watched the whole thing. I didn't watch any of that. What happened? Well, I want to. I don't want to spoil it. It was like a lot of oh, trash talk. He recently retro. blocked me. Who? He blocked me on. He blocked me. Uh, Phil Helmuth. What happened? I call him a clown on Twitter because he uh, he fucking it was like the beginning of COVID. He was just like, you're like I, I'm in the safe but sorry camp. You know, better safe than sorry camp. You know, like. Like all these COVID deniers and people are like, oh, ain't that big a deal? It's the flu. It's the, like, I say until we understand and we really understand the complexity of this virus, put a fucking mask on in public. It's proven that masks limit the spread drastically. So just listen to the experts and put a fucking mask on. So Helmuth was just like talking shit. Like he was just basically downplaying the virus in the middle of March, saying like, oh, you know, that they're fear mongering us and they're doing this and this, you know, like. You shouldn't like you know you, we shouldn't you know take these measures. We shouldn't close down. We should. We just telling people go on and live with your life when people were just literally dying by the dozens in Italy and we're seeing like these videos from Italy. So I just I just called him a clown. I just said clowns are gonna clown. And Phil Emmons is kind of a, like sure he's successful. He does. He's got 15 bracelets. He plays really well versus NXP. He's like the best against the Rex. You say poker. He's great personality for poker. He's he's good for the game. I have had conversations with him heads up in Malta. Like, just we got drunk in Malta together. We had like a really cool hour conversation about life and everything, like six, seven years ago. But I called him a clown because I think he was being a clown. Like, he has such a following of people that like actually might listen to him and, and like, oh, say, a uh, helmet doesn't wear a mask. I'm not going to wear a mask. Fuck it. Or like, 
Talmud thinks that this is ain't this ain't that big a deal, so it ain't that big a deal. Like you have such a you have such Close. reach yeah. that you you have you're putting this kind of information out there where you don't know anything. You have no idea. Like so, what hurts to do this? People saying, "Oh, you're breathing bacteria in, or you're not getting air." Like, come on, give me a break. Like, how often are we indoors in public places? In the supermarket? Where else? That's it for me. Like, where I can't. Where else am I? Like, you're gonna get plenty of air when you're indoors in your own house, or you're outside in the park, and you're exercising, or you're doing your things outdoors. You're with your family or the people that you quarantine with, like. There's only maybe like, you know, for people that don't have essential jobs, obviously, they wear the mask more often than I do. But like, for people that don't, like you wear the mask maybe an hour, an hour and a half a day, it ain't that big a fucking deal. Just the mask. And he was telling people like, it, it's, it's, this is, you know, COVID's not really, he's comparing it to flu and all that. So I just told him, I called him a clown he blocked. This is another one of the issues of socioeconomic background or just environment. Helmets obviously fall or AF and hit the places he hangs around with are just super nice and they're less likely things are gonna happen wrong. If there are areas that socioeconomic background isn't as good and there's they're more cramped. Obviously New York had a way bigger outburst than Los Angeles and the Bay Area yes. start because the proximity. Yeah, he's like, for the barrier. Yeah. So like pe- like the public can't necessarily calibrate to somebody else's personal experience or somebody else's environment. So like Yeah he, maybe he's he, out there he yeah. yeah, he's out there fucking doing Tai Chi in his backyard at the Rose Garden in, in Palo Alto with all this money and has all this you know, accessibility to, to Uber Eats and living his best life. And the hoods are getting hit hard because they social, like with the, the things you're saying, because they, they're so cramped. And where I grew up in Brockton, cramped, they got sick. And they don't have access to healthy, like organic food. And they don't know, they just don't know better to, like, you know, take a turmeric shot in the morning and do yoga and, and take tons of vitamin C and zinc. Where he has his access, and like, let's be, let's face it, Phil Hamlet's fans are people who live in Middle America who don't have access to all these things. So like, they don't live like, the Midwest loves Phil Hamlet, like the Midwest loves Survivor. So his fan base are these people that are, are living like lower middle class mostly, and like, it's just yeah. Well, about the heads up match, it was it was pretty entertaining because Antonio Svendiari and Phil Hamlet have a great verbal ri- rivalry. They obviously played up on camera, but. You know, I didn't see any of it. Where was it? Where was it? Where, where, where it, was this being filmed? It's on Poker Which, Poker Go. It, it, it's oh, okay. it's public I, on YouTube too. And oh like, really? Yeah, and there's I'll, I'll send you the link too. But you yeah. know, it's events like these that kind of you know invigorate general interest for poker because it's like, let's be honest, you and I are not the target demographic for Live with the Bike. Like, yeah. I am far more interested in running the show properly than watching any given show. Even goats like Garrett, Andy, Dan, Zach, Art, or whatever. I'm just like, yeah, I want to see what they're doing, but I'm not in the environments they're playing in anymore. Like, I I, I want to, you know, be building mm-hmm. stuff, make sure the players are protected, the community is protected, get, like, views like you, you know, that just give you guys access to a voice anytime you want. If you're on the show or you know me, you have access anytime you want. Just hit me up. And even if you're in the chat and you're reg, just hit me up and get you on. That's like one of the ways that I want to run things. Yeah. It's not an elitist thing. Like Poker has this problem. Not just poker. The world has this issue of there's this elite environment where people can't really access. They have this narrative where they're trying to like help the stuff that they're doing. Which honestly, it's like, yeah, if you're in that position, you don't wanna, you know, give stuff away. You wanna keep your position. But poker's like seat open, you have the money, you can play. Oh, for the most part. For the- <laughs> <laughs> bang, bang. Uh, ideally, games, are more of a meritocracy than real life because you could just enter and there's the set of rules that are essentially guarantees. Whereas like, we know how real life, how unfair real life is. People are born in different places, you know, your families, your friends, your environment. Environment's a huge role in, yeah. in success. Like, yeah, just environment's like key. Like just being around good people and it's just, 
makes you it makes you a huge difference in somebody's upbringing in life. And like, your upbringing is everything. It's uh, yeah. We we always root for the underdog that came from such adversity and and made the made a huge name for themselves. So those people you mostly respect, are like holy shit. Right. You know, they could have went one. It could have went one way, and it's the guys that had everything offered to them and they still find a way to fail. They you know, you just like, Jesus Christ! I wish I had some of those opportunities. I wish I was. Yeah. Able to go to you know be have the parents to tell me that college is important or go to get a you know I'm like education like going to college is not so you know people are so successful just graduating high school and, and coming up with business ideas and not having to go to school and be just three hundred thousand dollars in debt right off the bat but it would have been cool to go to college to have that experience you know I think it's really I I'm a big I'm a big supporter of uh, further education yeah. I think it's great meant to grow you know and. But to, anyways, to, to have like to, 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 to kind of go off what you're saying, you know, environment, guidance, you know, the, the people you keep around you are just uh, so crucial, you know, in success or becoming, you know, success, uh, successful, perhaps. And, so. Yeah, so like, I've been, I've been a, you know, like uh, like my skill sets compared to the rest of the world has been predominantly in predominantly in the gaming industry like i've done okay city level and national level and other things but mm -hmm. most of my world class abilities are in gaming and gaming gets a really bad flack poker gets a really bad flack it's more accepted now but there's always like this narrative in the gaming industry and the poker industry to be like Dude, there's so much skill, you know, you got to respect this industry where it's like every industry is hard. The saving grace and the good part of the gaming and poker industry is just like these are the set of rules. Everyone has to follow them. You compete. So it's at least in that environment, it's a meritocracy where there's so much unfairness in the world that at least in these environments, there's a certain amount of trust that it's supposed to be fair play. Why do, why do poker players dislike cheaters and angle shooters? Because it's supposed to be an environment where certain things are right and wrong and fair. That goes for all gaming industries. Like any competition, any competition in general, they want there to be fairness and integrity in the competition yeah. or else it, there's guidelines there's guidelines unless you know like if somebody's juicing or you know somebody's you know shooting steroids before fucking swimming a you know 500 meter relay or whatever like yeah if you find out about it you just feel so cheated you work so hard yourself yeah. to become the best poker player in the world and you know this other guy you're playing is four tabling with his his, his father's account and his girlfriend's account and just like what the fuck you know i'm not doing that should I be doing that? And you almost kind of, it's, it's kind of been an acceptable, some of this like on the line cheating has kind of been acceptable. Like a lot of pros are like, ah, you know, for, you know, with the jungle man thing recently playing on somebody else's account and, and Bill Perkins thinking it was somebody else. It was like, oh, that's been happening for years. So doesn't why, make what's it the right. big deal? Yeah. Doesn't make it right, dude. Like, what's the big deal? And like, you know, and then you kind of feel like it's a doggy dog world. Like you have to do those things to keep up because everybody else is doing them, but nah, I mean, I don't know. That's, why, that's why I just, I don't, I just, I just hate the online world. I just don't like, I just don't I just like being in person. I know what's going on. I see it in front of me. There it is. There's my cards. I sound like such a fish right now. But. I mean, we all have to make these choices in life. Like, you know, I've made a ton of mistakes. I'm trying to, you know, fix them to this day. Uh, but like, and I, and it's like, when we say our views, it's so hard to be like, oh, this like, oh, I'm mightier than thou, which is like, I definitely don't think so. And the more I listen about the environment and the world around, I'm just like, dude, everybody else is doing these things. Should I be doing them? And I started questioning myself. I, I talked with Joe Ingram. I talked with, you know, some other poker players I respect. I don't want to uh, mention their names because they, they want to be less in the spotlight or they don't want their opinions to publicize but just like i'm like am i am i doing something wrong because like yeah I, no it's just like something you gotta be like i talked to jared blesnick recently he is uh Pot you know uh yeah he's a you know he's got you know he had some 
some multi-table stuff back in the day that people came at him for and he's I mean me and him have been friends for a while but he, he just always tells me like he, we've had some recent cards. he just bought legacy sports sports cards a couple of years ago in Vegas and he's booming now because the recent card boom but he's crushing and he and he's telling me like you don't you don't ever since I met you don't you know you don't belong in the poker world Ron. you're too much of a nice guy like, you have to have some like you have to be cutthroat in order to like be really successful in poker and you have to take different lines that I don't think you're comfortable with doing or you know like a whole private game scene the politicking this and this and that can I, can I take a break to use the bathroom real quick yeah Go ahead. We, I'll, I'll entertain the awesome. audience. Yeah. All right. There's a bathroom in the room drank, you're in. <laughs> I just I just literally drank two of these Fijis like uh, 20 seconds. There's, like, there's more minutes. Fijis in that room. So yeah, Ronnie and I are in different rooms, social distancing. We had masks when we came in, but uh, he was he's staying with his buddy who has like seven dogs. And if you have any questions, I'm gonna I'll get to them in the chat. But basically, what Ronnie said about being too nice, people have said that about me as well. Uh, not like. There's so many things you can't Google that are not on camera. Not just the poker world, it's like every industry. Um, shocking, yes. Uh, and you have to make choices in life. Um, and as I said, like I've, I've definitely made a lot of mistakes um, trying to deal with them. But we, like, you kind of have to choose how you want to take life. And just like what... Uh, Lesnick said to Ronnie and I deal with this like yeah the people there are people even beyond like the home games in the networking they deal with the poker world in a much more cutthroat way than I ever have some of it I'm okay with it like integrity wise like I watch some people I'm like I should have been doing better I should have been doing more and you know like this is why my run out has gone the way it is like I probably run like at worst 8 out of 10 not probably 9 out of 10 maybe even 10 out of 10 with the way the cards broke but like when it comes to you know run outs like these super insane run outs maybe they're doing a lot of things play-wise or outside the box play-wise that you know that other people aren't doing like say ronnie and i get accused of being too nice <laughs> yeah uh that, that feels so much better now uh what was i what were we talking about just like this? just like whether we're willing to do stuff and i like i don't want to yeah. necessarily throw like individuals or operations on the just, yeah, I used to look down on some of those people, but I, I give them, I, I, I'm more on the side now, but like, you know what, good for fuck, like my hat's off to them, like organizing games, shedding pros out, you know, uh, politicking with the huge, like successful businessmen, and just, uh, you know, like I used to find it kind of uh, inauthentic, something that I can never really do, I just don't know how to like, you know, just befriend all these rich people, just to, to, to ring, them, ring them up in a fucking like a real rodeo, like just lasso them in, you keep them for yourself, and shut up. And keep some pros in the game that are giving you a piece, like oh I'll put you in, but like, but I, I find you to be, you know you're you're sociable, you know so you get to play with these people. Like it was all good when everything was not private, but that's that's the current climate. And like it's either you join them or you fucking get the fuck out. Like you either do your own thing yeah. or you leave. And you know to these people defense, like if you go to the Bellagio right now, you and you go to the upper high limit area. It's like six pros playing Taiwanese, waiting for one huge whale to come in. He comes in, they all get chips, they sit around him, they play when he leaves. They probably don't even wait that long, they stop playing Taiwanese again. It's like such a... So like the private games, these whales get to play with other whales. They have like five or six whales in the game, and it's a, it's a really cool environment. For, there's a lot of them that happen in the casino, they get the VIP experience, the seat is reserved for them. They don't have to deal with fucking six people like with headphones on, just like not really being personable, just being cutthroat. They want their money. It's all about their money. They don't know how to person. They don't know how to like, you know. Let's be. Let's face it. And I'm not. I'm not gonna throw any names under the bus as well. But 80% of these poker professionals are kind of like socially awkward. They don't. Ha they're not engaging. They don't know how to have like real normal conversations. They're not fun. They're kind of lame. And they're just like, you know, but GTO and just fucking playing. They're like, it's just like, dude. Like learn how to talk about you know, 
things other than poker at the table, like engage, like have fun. You go play five, ten up Elijah. There's some kids that like will talk to you, but they're just they don't want to give anything off, you know. And it's just like just like not fun. That's why I play limit hold'em these more these days because I have more fun. At least if I'm like trying to find another path in life, at least I can have fun while I'm still playing and still making an income. And that's limit hold'em for me. Like I'll I'll sit and play five ten to limit while I'm waiting for the no, no limit hold'em for a couple hours. Try to you know make a little money or you know stack somebody get stacked whatever play the game. But like I'll leave a really good no limit game to play a, a, a good a decent limit hold'em game because I feel at ease. I feel less stressed out. I feel I can actually have some conversations now. With, obviously with COVID, there's plexiglass in front of you. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Can't even hear anybody. You're like hello. I went in the Bellagio queue about two times to go to my box just to check it out. I was looking around. Like, this, is, this is not look fun. Yeah, definitely even in Limit Hold'em because the bike opened back up and I was pinch hitting to help start games. Like, you just can't hear people because of the masks. And um, it's definitely a lesser experience, but we, like, first and foremost, we got to make a safe environment. You know, like you mentioned, we don't know everything about... And people, we don't know everything about COVID, and people did mention, oh, the plexiglass doesn't do anything. It's like, up front, it doesn't do anything. But say you and I are sitting next to each other and we get into an argument. That plexiglass is physically, you know, preventing us from yeah. from escalating the situation. It may not fully prevent it, but it's still something. I think a lot of poker rooms are doing well, but I, I got a lot of messages from dealers, you know, from the Bellagio saying they got COVID, they're not doing that, they're really sick, and they, thank God, uh, besides Rob, which is obviously a very fucking sad story, uh, nobody else has passed. I, I know a couple other people that passed from COVID yeah. that were in the poker world, and I've heard of one guy who played poker, died recently in his 60s, but, you know, thank God a lot of people are getting it and just having mild symptoms or getting having awful symptoms and going to the hospital and getting released and feeling better. But we just don't know the long-term effects. Like, there's, like, this fatigue syndrome that people are having that once they get it, or they, like, have trouble breathing even after or having heart issues. And it's just, we don't, like you said, we don't know anything about it. So, don't so want just people. Calm. <laughs> so, calm down. Stop telling people how to live. Stop telling people you're sheeps. Tired of the sheep talk, like. It's not oh, pol you it's not polarized. Like you could have really bad cases and you could have like really good cases. There's a whole bunch in between. That's like something's yeah. like eighty percent bad or fifty percent bad. You still don't want any of that. No, you don't. You know, it's exactly. I just don't understand it, you know, this this uh mask stampeding people down, not wearing masks. Uh, I mean not not uh having their mask on. I had I had some lady yell at me telling me I should be ashamed of wearing a mask in Wyoming basically. I was like, not today. I just looked at her. And my, I was like, not today, lady. Not today. It's like walking right by her. Like outside, like, you, you should be ashamed wearing your mask. Take your mask off. You know, with her fucking Trump sticker and shit. Like, I, I have a lot of Republican friends. I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself a liberal. I mean, a conservative. I mean, a Republican or a Dem. I put myself in the middle. I'm a practical guy. I lean a little right sometimes. I lean a little left. I don't even like saying leaning to the left or right. I just say I agree with some policies and some of these, Paul, like, you know, it's like, you know, both sides can be right on a lot of issues, and it's just the extreme of each side that I just can't really listen to anymore. Uh, but, like, like going back to COVID, just have have a heart. You know, people are dying, uh, and it's it affects a lot. It affects most people. Might have, hopefully, don't have any long-term health effects. Most people just get over it and feel better. But a lot of people aren't. And, uh, you know, I don't know anything about herd immunity. There's a lot of talk about we should just like let people go out and just live their lives and people are going to die and we just got to deal with it. Like, I don't like that. It's sad. I mean, definitely my main concern is like, you know, if you get me sick or I get you sick, it's not good, but it's not even the end all. It's like if I get you sick and then you get your dad sick and he's one of the vulnerable demographic, I can't live with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I just... I'm hanging. I'm seeing my dad now that I'm on this trip, and I'm, you know, when I get back to Vegas, I'm not. Gonna, I'm gonna stay away from him. Like I used to just go visit him and have my mask on, but even now I'm just like, maybe when I get back home, I should quarantine for a couple of weeks and not even see him. Like just because like, I haven't seen him a couple of weeks now. Just yeah, I would. Uh, God, my dad. He's he's one of the really, you know, one at risk. He's got COPD. Oh my gosh. Is, uh, yeah, the lungs. Yeah, he's got lung Smoking? lung disease. Does he smoke? 
he smoked for 50 something years of his life he quit it's, whole yeah. turkey when he got the diagnosis 13 years <laughs> you ago. have to yeah got, di got diabetes yeah they gave him a few years to live if he stopped kept smoking he quit and he's been living fine for 50 14 years after but he's got like the entry-level diabetes not the worst diabetes a high blood pressure so he's like my dad's a coin flip if he got COVID. it's like I, I would say he would be he's a strong guy uh but I, you know you know, he's he's struggling. He's stuck. He's, he's thank God sports are back. You watch that. So. <laughs> yeah, like uh, people rip on like sports or games. Even it's like a quote quote waste of time. Well, you know what? If people are spending time entertaining themselves, they're not getting into trouble. <laughs> like there, this, like there was like whatever a decade, maybe two decades ago, where they were saying video games like inside violence there is no proof of that and if, if anything if people are sitting at home playing video games they're not you know out committing crimes or yeah yeah like if you if, if you play fucking grand theft auto and you think it's okay to go outside and hit somebody over the head with a gun and take their car and then go run over four people you just mentally you have issues uh, you know maybe there's something to be said about people who are like a little off their rocker so when they play that game it gives them inspiration to do so i don't know but like you know, I'm, what about movies? I mean, just I like see, it's... I think I've been in. Yeah, what about what about movies? What about war? What about you know actual things that actually happen out there? And reading the news and uh, it's yeah. not to say that war. that there aren't negative influences. There are definitely negative influences, but that's like real life. Everything has positives. Everything has negatives, and we have to like navigate ourselves. And like you know, I'm not extremely vocal about polarized views but i try to tend to move like the needles at least in the poker industry and the gaming industry in real life like in a general higher direction so hopefully at least tomorrow's a better day than, than today like things just take time to to go in a better direction like look at all the yeah. stuff around us like this was not built in one day it wasn't like a 160 character tweet or somebody yelling rah, 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 you should have done this no this stuff was like literally built over decades humans have been evolving for like thousands of years i mean the protests are cool. like people you know there's, there's things are going to be hopefully all these protests are going to lead to positive changes hopefully but you know a lot of people are online screaming about certain things and nothing's happening people just going off online on twitter and and, and yelling at other people like you want to if you want to be a person if you want to change certain something run for Build office it. go you, go Build do something it. about it stop yeah. Build it. Stop fucking crying. Talking. Yeah, about don't talk. It. Talking, Do just like yelling at other people with different views. And you just like, my, my boy Will Jaffe said the other day, like, just like, I, I'm talking about this and this and that, but I'm, I'm doing nothing about it. So I'm just no better than the other, the other asshole screaming on the other side. Like, if you want something to happen, go be a product of change. Like, go, go change it. Go try right. to change it. Do something that can help that cause that you feel like something's unfair. But well, that's what a lot of these protesters are doing. Like, and I had a friend the other day who told me I should be part of I should go to the protest for BLM. Like, I support I it's, but there's a fucking pandemic going on. I take care of a seventy seven year old human being. I can't be out there and mass of people. Like I'm sorry, you you might not have and like, you know, they were like a little off by it. I'm like, buddy, like I res I, I, I do everything I can do in my power. I just continue to to be to learn and be and grow and become the best version of me and become a good person and you know help as many people as I can, but I can't be in these crowds of people, uh, you know, with a, with a, with a protesting during a global pandemic. I just, for me, it doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, especially during quarantine, people have reached out to me to like create poker content with them and just like all my energy creating poker content has to go to live with the bike. I, I can't participate in something else. And like, that's what, you know, like you mentioned about the big time, like, no, like when I've been developing this stuff and it's, it's been hard and a lot of, a lot of work but for, over four, I think four and a half years now. And I collaborate with a lot of people. I bring you on the podcast, I bring so many people on the podcast. When people ask the cloud, I'm like, come on the podcast. But it's like, clearly like, you know, I'm a partial owner of Live of the Bike and I, you know, hopefully get my mm -hmm. job back on the bike. I serve them. Like that's, <laughs> that's what I do. And, you know. Live of the Bike's cool, man. I'm gonna have to play in it one day. I like, I love, I love, I love Live of the Bike. Uh... It's great. It's great for the poker world. It's great for what we do and get, get to showcase different people's games and the content's nice. I've watched a lot of the videos. Really cool stuff. Um, I had something to say to kind of feed off what you're saying right now. Oh, I hope whoever's watching this is like, you know, uh, learning a, about the poker world and the intricacies of the poker world and just more about my life and Wayne's life or find this interesting. 
I feel like it's kind of gone a little stale right now. Maybe we can spruce it up a little. Definitely, uh, Doug Polk versus Daniel Negreanu. Let's let's spice that one up. What are your? Oh my god! On? Yeah, let's yeah let's talk about yeah. Let, that's great. I'm happy you brought that up. Uh, <sighs> Doug Polk is just like ruthless. He'll fuck if he doesn't oh, dude, like you. Yeah. You don't want to get on Doug Polk's bad side. You know he'll just rip you apart. And <laughs> uh, you know Negreanu is just like. Like I said, we're all flawed. I like Nogaranyu, you know? I've had some weird run-ins with him. Like, he's somebody who's, like, huge on speaking somebody's language to get closer to them or to, like, kind of, like, relate to them. And, like, I kind of find it really inauthentic. Like, as a couple times, it, especially earlier when, you know, he just kind of knew me in the late, like, 2008, nine. I came, ac I came across him, and I started to get more known. He kind of knew who I was after I won a bracelet in 2012. He said something really nice about my bracelet interview, saying, like, this is what poker's all about. Like, this is somebody who loves cards. Like, my 2012 Poker News interview on winning a bracelet, he's like, he, he like, messaged uh, me on, on social media saying this is, like, reminded him of what poker, like, the heyday of poker, like, at the Binions. This is, like, good stuff. And he's always been supportive of me. He's been nice to me. But he comes around me, and he'll just be like, yo, what up, dog? What up, dog? What up, Ronnie B? Yo, dog, what's going on? Do oh, shit, dog. Yo, we're chilling right now. Yo, yo, we are chilling. And I'm like, <laughs> like, I don't go around Harvard, like, nerds or, like, people who have, like, like, I don't go, I, I don't come across, like, you know, nuclear physicists and try to speak their language, like, oh, you know, like, and try to, like, or, or, or anybody. I just, like, be myself. Like, sure, I adapt and I, like, will like do little things to kind of like fit in or kind of like you know mesh with certain people but i don't go as far as like trying to sp first of all i don't talk like he's like his perception of me is i'm like this kind of urban and i am like an urban guy who's got swag who's like lived in like a you know in a kind of like uh you know urban environment like just like kind of i have a lot of hip-hop and uh you know i've been in the inner, like inner city and i've i've, I've got this like grit to me and to fair his defense sure like I've, I've i've conversated like that but like talk like you daniel like come to me and be daniel legron you don't try to you know i don't know what i was kind of he did that to me in Brooklyn. he did it to me at the world series a couple times i'm like whatever but like daniel's a huge survivor fan when i was knocked out first he was like dude you looked like something was wrong with you you look cracked fiend you look like a fiend like you're known as somebody who's like extremely happy always smiling always out there like people love you like what the fuck happened out there what went wrong like he had such a good read he tweeted like that wasn't the ronnie barter we know like who was that it was in a single frame of you smiling i was out of it on the island for the first few days i was on survivor everybody on survivor thought i was this creep like awkward creepy kind of dude who was that wasn't being received well and i've never been received like that my whole life and i could feel it i could feel everybody not wanting to really fuck with me say like like they didn't really want to mess with me like they were like this guy's weird this guy's shady and my whole poker career i've known i've been known like people want to talk to me engage with me play with me people invite me to parties i'm like the life of the party of like, ronnie's great come hang out like so to have to deal with that failure and being being like i want to be like no this is not me guys this is not me when you're going through physical chronic pain which creates some uh mental stress and anxiety and depression you're not yourself, and you just wish these people would actually know who you are. And now we're going off top again. Let's come back to the Doug Polk, Daniel Legrand, you thing. When he made that video, which is now deleted, I tried to send it to somebody like two days ago because they didn't see it's, it. It's on Seriously Serious's channel. <laughs> it's still up. It's got like 20K views now. Yeah, It's the on a channel? different channel. Ser I'll, I'll send you the link. Doug send Polk's the editor. Link. Doug, Polk edit Doug Polk's editor's channel. It's on his link. I mean, that video was unfucking believable Oof. That was so... That was so good. That was like ether. That was like Nas dropping ether on Jay Z. But like, like I like Negreanu. He's done a lot for the poker game. He's flawed. Like he's got, you know, he's got some issues. He's recently probably going through a lot of stuff. You know, he's not. And it just shows. He like kind of went off on some people on the tw on the chat. But you know, some of these kids, dude, who like hype shit in into like poker chat and cash games. See, like I hope your mom gets cancer. I hope you know, fuck your wife. She's disgusting. You're people making fun of Sean Deeb and his wife, like. Fuck you! Like, what? What gives you the right to say these things about people? And you know what? If somebody said something to Daniel's wife that was degrading or about his life or something, all pa like, sure, he should conduct himself because, like, 
in a certain manner because he's like poker's ambassador one of poker's like you know yeah there's a certain way he should come off because he represents us in it but like the, he's not perfect if yeah. he lost it like leave, like he lost it on somebody like maybe they maybe they deserve it he said some fun he said some poop, really weird shit yeah, but like that that's you know, touching up on when we grew up, we didn't grow up with internet. Like it came out when I was a teenager, it came out probably when you're around ten or something like that. So we had a lot more face to face and even when it came out, it wasn't like as big as it is now. A lot of the kids growing up now that grow up with internet, they don't have nearly as much face to face interaction as we did when we grew up. And that takes practice, you know. I'm to this day I'm learning about face-to-face -face interactions and for people to just like be able to avoid it by staying behind a computer and just like saying whatever the hell they want that just promotes oh. really bad behavior and i don't want to twitter thugs man they're a bunch of twitter thugs they just twitter hand they got their twitter fingers you know yeah they just go I, off and i don't like talking oh, I, I don't want to be like don't wear the headphones don't wear the ipads because then you're just like talking down to them like i want to be like this is the environment that we were in. This is the environment you're in now. And I get it. There were times where I don't like being social. I like sitting behind a computer. But it takes practice getting out of your comfort zone and talking to people in real life. And one of the things you clearly learn in real life is when you cross boundaries, like talking about something or like verbally abusing someone, you're going to get punched in the face or even worse. Yeah, there's no consequence for these, these twigs. Like that's another thing we can touch upon like cheaters and people who like rob people for money or or get staked and don't pay or blow the stake off in the fucking pits like they should get punched in the face but they don't because like a lot of these kids would do it they just take it tuck up as a loss well it's kind of their responsibility because they had trust them first or yeah it's just like there should be like some kind of poker police or like penalties like this mike postal is a good example he's not gonna he's not he's not getting not suffering any consequences i mean like his his name is is tarnished and he'll you know, nobody want to play with him anymore, or like people will boo him when he walks into a poker room or whatever. But like, that's the most that he's gonna suffer. Like, he should be put in jail for fucking ten years. You know, set an, ex set an example. Like, boom, this is this is the consequences of like doing what he did. You know, or it's just sad. Like somebody who, who like steals staking money or gambles somebody's money off or runs or gets it like, it's just, you know, blow somebody's account. Like, sure, they won't be able to get staked or maybe, I don't know. I just feel like there should be more consequences for some of the, the shit that some of these poker players do, you know. But uh, I don't promote violence, but sometimes somebody deserves to get slapped, you know. It's just like the threat of even. And like in in face in a face-to-face -face setting, if you go, if you start going too far, the other person is going to say something and be like, hey, you're going too far. You don't want to head in this direction. And then when you're face-to-face -face with somebody, you're like, okay, you get the hint. But like when you're behind a computer and they can't like react, you know, yeah, it's kind of like I have people talk. I have people talk shit to me on on, on Twitter. I'm at me, and then they see me, they're just like, yeah. I'm right here. Like, you want you want to have a conversation? Let's go. Let's talk about it personally. Like, you ask, like, you had a problem with me? What, what's this beef? You got? I'm not gonna throw with these guys. I mean, me and the kid now we're cool. I mean, we're not cool, but we're like whatever cordial. Sure. We see each other, whatever. I have times too. Talk shit. Yeah, where like I get into it with a person over the internet or over text and I'm just like this is definitely not going a good direction let's do a face to face or something and I'll call you I'll just fucking boom yeah both no. we we talk on the phone no, like, or or we do a face to face and obviously nothing ever is resolved 100% but that that phone call or the face to face resolves a lot of the issues and time heals a lot of you know wounds like just give space mm -hmm. give time once the issues are kind of aired out you know, give it time and we're all hopefully we still have like a lot of decades left in our lives. So we definitely don't want to be yeah. hung up of our on we, these things. We say in Hebrew to uh Ad Mayor three that means to hundred and twenty. Like when you say you talk to somebody on somebody's birthday, you say happy birthday until hundred and twenty. Because we always we think that like one hundred and twenty is like the capacity like the most somebody can live a human can live. Like a it's like an Israel, it's like a Jewish thing, but yeah, I mean, there's, it's just there's like I think we need more face-to-face -face conversations. We need more human interaction. We need more balance in terms of, like you know it's not good for your psyche. It's not good for you mentally to be behind a computer screen all day. You know, it's it's just really not. And uh, you know, we need more. You know, it sucks. <laughs> we need more of this, but now it's COVID, so 
you know, being behind a computer is probably the best place to be right now. We're doing things at home and staying home and not spreading the virus. It is, but you don't have to, like, just, like... And I get it, like, when you're young, you need to test things out. You didn't just... When you poke the bear, the bear can lash out back at you, or, you know, bad things can happen, and it's a growing process. I'm poking bears, I just, I just hiked a lot with my bear spray. Did not have the... Fortunately and unfortunately, I didn't. I wasn't able to see any bears out in the wilderness, but I had my bear spray. Um, how many views have we got right now? Twenty-seven. It's my guess. It's been must be it, dying. Up. No, no. It, I mean, it died off a little bit from peak, but it's still people are still hanging. I don't know why I care. I'm just interested to see how many people are watching. Well, it's always the after because people don't necessarily catch it live, but all the good ones, they you know, like yeah. I get I get comments because like my stuff's critically liked and like we were talking about, we just want to move the needle in a better direction, like. We're just, you know, real about this stuff. Like, poker is not what you see necessarily see on TV or the Instagram chip porn. It's like, I've seen you for over well, 15, I, 15 years. So, yeah, people post about all the times they win. I post about my losses. Like, I'll, I'll Instagram, I'll Instagram a fucking story. Like, I just got crushed today. I lost this. And all that. People never, they, people never post the empty rubber band on the table with like uh, three white birds in front of them and like them being visible. It's always these huge stacks. I made, you know. And people will like it, you know, like that's me asking how many viewers we have. It's like me like posting a post on Instagram, like, how many likes do I have? I have seventy two. Like I watch it. No, it's, I mean, it's like, you know, a natural curiosity. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's it's like, you know, how many people are interested in what I have to say, you know, what's going on. But uh, you know, we are doing this on a Sunday during the day during COVID. Yeah, but, but I, I hopefully I, I'm just hoping people get something out, enjoyment out of this or some information that they they can help them out or there's a good you know, thumbs up uh, ratio, so that's always a, a good indicator. And like I said, we just leave good. these things up for all time, and you never know how it explodes like later because like some some videos, usually poker videos, but even my podcast, like uh, randomly, like six months later, it'll, there'll be a huge up spike in, in videos. It's always whether it gets recommended, whether it gets shared, the guests I have, they like, make a big score, and just like there are all these things that have to do with it. What do you think of like Doug mm -hmm. Polk's side of the whole Nick Ronda versus Doug Polk incident? I, I I think Doug Polk is doing what Doug Doug Polk's on a Doug Polk. I find I think it's great. I think it's funny. Uh, I think the beef is funny. People like beef, you know. We all like when, when two rappers go at it. As long as there's an end of violence, like Tupac and Biggie. I mean, we, I yeah. don't think those those two deaths were attributed to the beef, but for them beefing. But like, as long as there's no violence and there's, there's things can be hashed out, like a heads up poker match or. a some kind of like boxing match with headgear or something funny, like whatever they they're going back and forth with each other. I think it's more Poe coming at Negroni. Negroni's trying to take like, you know, Negroni's not as confrontational as Poe is. Poe is real. That's the thing. Like I don't get into Twitter wars because I I'm terrible at writing. I am an awful speller. I my my grammar is like you know, sixty seventy percent. Like I don't. So I'm gonna get ate up on Twitter. If I try to get into any debates on Twitter. I'll get eaten up hot. So I just stay away from any like all like any beef on Twitter. Twitter's all about beef. Everybody's just coming at each other. It's like my dad just said he didn't like it. I'm actually gonna be like this. He's like I d I'm watching it, I'm listening, and I don't like it. But hey, it's okay. Like, you know. Uh Jesse Cartland says shout out to Ronnie, truly one of the most enjoyable people I've gotten to play with live poker with your attitude overall is super inspirational, man. Who's saying that? Jesse Kirtland. Jesse Kirtland, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, my dad's questions. a little mad because I talked about my my childhood. Sorry, Daddy. I talked about losing houses and it's like part of life, Dad. Don't worry about it. Nobody nobody's looking down at us. Like it's uh, things happen. I'm I'm sorry, Dad, for sharing that uh that personal uh, personal stories. People like people like hearing about personal things, real, and yeah. I think it's it's real, Dad, to talk about and being vulnerable. And I'm sorry, Dad. I love you. And I'm sorry to talk about you know those things. Sorry. One thing too is like the people who trash talk most of the times are not building things themselves. Like you like if you build things yourself, you have more appreciation for other people that build things and you know, <laughs> then you're just like kinda you know. I think content creators generally want to stay positive with, with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and we also know how it is just being shot like, you know, shots fired anywhere whether and like if, i probably don't even get close to all of them but private messages are you know told to me and shown to me there's a lot of shots fired out there so you know yeah yeah uh, people uh people are ruthless people don't mind uh coming at each other you know 
I got, I've gotten some arguments in my time, you know, and uh, I wish I handled it myself in a, in different, in a, a bit way, a bit different in some altercations. But all in all, I stand for my opinions. I stand for the way I feel about certain people and certain things. And uh, you know, I might, I, I ref, right now, I refrain ninety nine point nine percent of the time. I just read it. I'll share it with my inner circle, my group chats. I'm like, look at this fucker. Man, can you believe this guy or that? But I just, I don't get involved. I think it's there's no doesn't add any value to my life yeah. some people are just you can't even you can't even speak to some people they're never they're first of all listen. like yeah they're not gonna listen and like for me like if i'm not that close with you why do i why do i care so much sure i hope you do better things and i hope you you know don't be so ignorant or try to try to look at other people's views and try to be more open and have a bigger heart but like if we're not that close i'll just share it with my friends but like look at this guy like somebody who's big in the focus they're part of they're in my industry so it kind of matters to me. I'll like listen to them, and I'll be like, "Oh." Let's... Yeah. I've adjusted so much being on broadcast too. Like I'm not the person I started off in. I started off as, excuse me, uh, Family Guy. Got to eat. Asked, uh, "Why are you at this point in your life?" Meaning, like, why? Maybe he's asking. This was why. like a while ago. So <laughs> he says, "So many viewers okay. on." We peaked out over fifty for sure, like concurrent. But there's gonna be like thousands, probably definitely over a thousand. Uh, you know, I, uh, why am I at this point in my life? Maybe he's talking about why I'm thinking about taking a different direction. Because a lot of people are like, dude, you're a professional poker player. Like, you get to, you can live in the dream. You get to go play a game for a living and you're complaining about it. You're successful. You have enough money to eat. That is true. You know, you're doing well. It's, 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 these things are all true. But it's not like, like, look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kind of bad mouth. Poker, being a professional poker player, it's great. It's, it's 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 allowed me to see the world. I made a lot of great friends like Wayne, which I'm speaking to now, and I've I've, I've Thank my, you. some of my best friends. Yeah. You know, some of my best friends are out of poker, and my best experiences are from poker. But when it comes to time where you want to do a bit more, maybe for society or something, or if, when you when you have that feeling that you can't help, something that I can't really explain, that you kind of feel a little empty. You feel like you want to do more. You want something new, you want to change, what's next kind of chapter. Like like I said, I'm never gonna retire from poker, like playing. I'll probably play when life comes around again for the rest of my life, the minimum 10 to 15 hours a week. Or at least one night a week, I play poker with the boys at the local casino. But maybe I'm doing something else. I just, I'm hungry for something new. I want to get into something that when I wake up in the morning, I'm super pumped for. When I wake up in the morning these days, I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna go play 40 yeah. or go play 80 and go see a few people that I like, have a nice meal at the casino. Maybe I'll make $4,000 and I'll be able to do this or put it into this or buy the stock or buy some more crypto or go buy some more basketball cards that I wanna invest in or put in the bank or just live, like whatever. I don't know, it's just like 17 years now, the same thing over and over again. Sure, there are other things that I've done in my career, Survivor and travel the world and, and invest and do a, fun things with different people and, and, and learn about different cultures, yes. But I don't know, man. Maybe I want to open up a smoothie fucking bar in Vegas. Maybe I want to, you know, sell like, sell some homes, or maybe I want to, you know, uh, get into nutrition, become a nutritionist, go back to school. Naturally, my body's crying for something. I'm one who's very in tune with my body, and it's telling me emotionally everything. All all my nerves in my body is saying like, uh, there's something. It's got to. This this can't be life. It's got to be more. Like this. It's got to be something else. And sometimes I'm at the poker table and I'm looking around. It's and it's not even to do with being down. Like I could be up three thousand dollars playing forty. And I'm just sitting there, kind of like, this is it? Like, is this what I'm going to be doing forever? It's like, I don't know. Like, I, I want to be part of something like that could change, help. Like, I want to do something that's going to help other people make that. I want to help make other people's lives easier, and hopefully, it, I can monetize it to it makes my life more comfortable as well. And it's just a win-win. Like, I don't want to feed people poison. I don't want to like open, you know. I don't want to sell, you know, like fucking. I don't want to open up a vape store, you know. Like, I want to, I want to be happy about like a lot of people. Just look for what, what what can they make money? Oh, I'll just like, I'll just transport goods from China and sell them on Amazon, and I'll just make so much money. Like, that's great, good for you. But I want I want to do something where it's extremely meaningful extremely fulfilling makes me happy makes me money 
I know that's hard. I know. But life is hard, and I'm willing to accept that challenge, and I'm willing to do it. So hopefully that answered your question. And this podcast, hopefully, a step in that direction, you know? I'm trying to... Yeah, it's good to talk... It's good to talk about these things and put them out in the universe. Like, you know, I'm a big believer of that. If you want something, put it out there. You want to be something, become that person. You want to be something, you must become it. So it's like relationships. If you want to meet a really nice girl and and meet somebody, you must become those things. You can't be a scumbag and meet an angel. I I guess it happens sometimes. You know, you can be a good actor. You know. Um, The Black Croc asks, "How did you learn to sing so well?" Uh, I uh, was always musically inclined. My mom was a really good singer. My sister's a good singer. My brother's a sick fucking rapper. Uh, we just musically inclined. We didn't, you know, we grew up in the southern Boston area. and We had a lot of musically, you know, inclined people around us, musically talented people. You know, I don't sing as good as I used to. Uh, my voice is, you know, I smoked, you know, a, a decent amount of uh, chronic in Garcia Vegas and, 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 uh, Philly Blunts and, and Dutch Masters growing up kind of made my voice harsh. I had a lot of screaming and yelling, a lot of a lot of late nights drinking. Uh, I don't warm up my voice anymore, so if I was to sing to you right now, I'd be at 25%. But uh, how I became a good singer, I think I was just naturally talented. I just I, I listened to Boyz II Men a lot, Mariah Carey, Ryan McKnight, Donnell Jones, Case, New Edition. I mean, I can keep going. You know, like, you know, Jesse Powell, Heath Sweat, I just loved R&B music, and I modeled my voice after them. I just loved listening to the music and riffing like them. I have a very good ear. I can never. I'm. I'm I, that's why I'm always on tone. I, I like I'm always on pitch. So when people hear me sing, like, oh shit, you can sing. And I, my whistle is. That's a you know. That's a put myself. He put myself out there. My whistle is like I whistle like an angel. Like I'll whistle in the middle of a story today, and people are like, that was you whistling. Oh my god, that was amazing. You sing. I'm like, yeah, I sing. I love music. I love music, and that's another thing I might get into. Like. Maybe make beats, maybe get into the music industry of some sort, maybe be a talent promoter. Uh, to, I mean, a talent, like like search for talent and, and help manage them and help manage. Because I wish I had somebody who was really good at like knowing what to do with somebody who's so talented, because I believe I was so talented in my teens and my early 20s. If I had somebody who could mold me and tell me, okay, we need to stop hanging out with this certain crowd, maybe switch my look a little. Hey, you should grow your hair, you should get in a diet. Like, just like really, see the potential in me and bring me out to the California and put me in like and get me into film and, and singing that would be cool there's so much talent that's not being seen out there everywhere around the country that there's just so many stars that don't make it that don't get that just get overlooked so maybe that could be a real thing and part of it too is like you gotta you know you have some foundation you gotta put in the effort to like put yourself out there and build and just don't have the expectation I think a lot of people have the expectation of, oh, you did this, and then they feel entitled that something's going to happen. It's like, no, 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 no. No. If if you even get discovered, it's been, like, building for, like, years or a decade plus, and then somebody sees something with you. And even then, after you scout it out, there's still, like, an adjustment and development period before you're ready for the world to see. So people don't... You know, it's a hard it's, yes it, it, becoming a superstar in music is like getting hit by lightning it's, it's super hard and it's it, it's amazing people like Ashanti who's who's not a talented at all who made a huge career in first I mean I mean I can't say it's unfair for me to say she's not talented but she's not a great singer you know Ricky Martin not the best singer you know J-Lo not the best singer J-Lo's an amazing performer decent actress you know she she works fucking hard these people worked hard so you can be talented and you're not you don't work as hard and, and it's just like that that space where you need to you, know, you need to be halfway decent, but if you work extremely hard, you might get what you want to be. You can be the best thing in the world, but if you don't put any effort into it, like who cares? Is it a biz business? Like you know, you get discovered, and hopefully somebody will like you know guide you and tailor you and put you out there. But it's just a hard profession, you know. But I love music. Man. Music is music. I listen to music constantly. I sing and whistle. I know. <laughs> I remember, like I don't remember which day it was, but you know, we were we were at commerce, and then you just like started busting out, and I was like. Whoa! And then you you said that you know some things like substances or drinking ruined you, or or you were just better before than you were at that job. Yeah, every, I mean, like it's when you're young, you're better. When you when you're fresh as a daisy, and you're 16 to the age 22, like that's your prime in terms of like vocal ability. And like even like you see girls like Mariah Carey and 
uh, you know, even Luther Vandross, I mean, God rest his soul, but at the end of their careers, like, they were in half the same as they were when they were younger. Because you just get old. It's just part of life. Things, <laughs> you know? So, but, uh, but yeah, I don't beatbox as much as I used to. I can never beatbox a team. When I was 20, I would just beatbox for no reason. You know? No. It's so a different, just, you know, these, it was a different yeah. world, too. So, it's like, I feel like when we were growing up, it was more like, let's do positive things. Let's, you know, let's do things constructive. Now, the world, even without COVID, due to the internet, everything is so crazy and everything's like, let's pull it back, guys. Let's let's remember, you know, what the stuff's, what, what life's about and try to do what we can. So it's just like really polar opposites. Like the internet plus social media, iPhones, smartphones have just like really put humans to a test. I have a different world, uh, you know, it's one that uh, you definitely got to get in or you got to get in where you fit in. If you don't, you're going to get stamped, you're going to get ran over. So, but it's uh, like I said, like a lot of these guys who are constantly on their phones and uh, and I'm a victim of it too. I, I, I try to limit myself, I'm my screen time too. as much as possible, yeah. you know, and uh, I, I don't, I wouldn't call myself a millennial. I don't want to, I, I don't like, I don't like putting myself in groups but you know i'm more on the gen x side i was born in 82 so that's, that's like the cutoff i say for millennial gen x but i consider myself a bit more old school you know i'm a very engaging person i like calling before texting like if somebody texts me i don't like texting paragraphs if it's more than two sentences just fucking call me people get surprised sometimes i call them like hello they're like oh hello I'm like can you just text like i don't want to text you i want to talk to you. you get this quick done quickly just talk and then we're done you know text text these text conversations all right, we're, we're about to hit the three hour mark. You know, obviously glad to have you and we could go on forever, ever, ever, yeah. ever. But do you have any uh, people you want to shout out? Any messages that you want to give? Uh, I just want to say, you know, yeah, first of all, I, I shout out my girl Heather and the Hit Living Foundation. Uh, you can put the link down there on the bottom after the yeah. send done. If you like, if you have the uh, resources to own a dog and have a dog, they're great companions, they're beautiful lives and they need to, Right now is even even more so in COVID and the current climate we're in. People are adopting left and right. So if you ever wanted to find it, get a dog and train them, right now is the perfect time. Look into that. You can save a life. Lots of dogs, lots of dogs are being euthanized left and right. So you can do your you know your uh, part and, and and adopt. Um, and another overall message is like stop being so mean to people that have different views than yourself. Try to have some compassion. Try to understand. I know it's hard. Just like. It's not resolving anything just to say some mean things to certain people, you know. Uh, be more nice. Be more be more a little empathetic to the older crowd out there. People are dying. COVID is real. It's my message. I I'm a, I believe it's. I know it's real. Uh, you know, I've seen it firsthand, and my sister got it. She said she had a tough time battling it. Uh, what other plugs? I mean, I have nothing else to plug. Um, you know, I I appreciate everybody listening to my story. Dad, I'm sorry about talking about. You know, us losing the house and the gambling times. They were fucking fun times. I appreciate you taking me to Mohegan Sun and Foxwoods every other weekend. They were great. You know, could things been different? Yeah, but whatever. It's all good. I'm sorry. My dad was tuning in. He heard that. He was a bit hurt about that. So, like, I'm, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, sensitive to his feelings. I'm sorry, Dad. But, pa um, Papa, you raised a really good son. We all we all have immense respect for it, for Ronnie. So forgive him you know, one time yeah, it's probably in, probably not the only time he's he's messed up but he's every day ronnie barda trying to be a better person and we we see it and feel it yeah i love you dad and uh yeah i just i just stress to people like have some compassion i i can't stress that more enough have some empathy you know if if the world could just try to understand everybody's story and walk and not be so standoffish maybe we can come to some kind of agreement and i don't know and i don't know what else to say you know uh Nothing like look in terms of me, you know. Hopefully, when I come up with a business idea, I know everybody will be supportive of me and and help me out if it's uh, something that I'm really passionate about. I know people will support me, so I'm very grateful of people's support. I'm very grateful for the the, the viewers that we've had today, and I'm very grateful for you for bringing me on, and able to talk about current life and what's going on with poker and everything else. I love poker. I'm still passionate about it. I'll continue to play for the rest of my life. It's a great game. If if you want some help learning about maybe how to get into it. You can always message me. It's not it's not a one answer thing, you know. Like I can try to I try to assess where you're at in your poker career and I give free advice. So 
reach out to me on social media. It may take me a few days, but I always get it to everybody. Ronnie Barta, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully we'll be back. Thanks, guys. On Live with the Bike and another yeah, podcast. Maybe after, fir- maybe after First Boot Survivor three years from now, I'm on there <laughs> and I fucking, I just do everything I want to do on that show and I, and I end up.